Hi everyone, and welcome to, I mean, all the brave people who came to the conference room today. Um, I said the brave because it's a kind of interesting coincidence that we are still waiting for guests. And for those who know how much they care about art, physical experience, as a need to go with your own body to the space and to experiment artwork, installation, films, painting, whatever. It's, uh, it, it, it's really interesting to be here together. And also hi to all the people who are following us online, because there's also this uh, uh, very uh, tremendous aspect of technology that we can nowadays have a meeting together really and virtually. So I also want to welcome two whole speakers of the day, April Williams, Evgeny Morozov, Jean Laseg, Catherine Baker, Mai Tuboui, Noel Anderson, Hamak Molavi, Shazeda Ahmed, and Tarek El Aris. And uh, after, I will give the voice to my colleague and co-creator, <laughs> the amazing Noam Segal, part of the artistic team. Um, composed with I Min mean, Racha, Marie-Hélène, and Lynn. But before, I just want to contextualize, um, I would say, um, personally, the reason I wanted the meeting today. I think um, I have to say, as both an artist and uh, someone very interested in psychoanalysis and technology, I've always been sensitive to the fact that while we take for granted that our interaction with technology, particularly in terms of attention, work through electronic devices, it actually has, of, of course, always happened with non-electronic devices, non-electronic relations. And um, I think the reason I wanted to invite in the, con in the context of the Berlin Biennale this conference is that like all of us, I really think that we are living an incredible shift in civilization. And this, uh, I mean, the way to address it uh, properly is definitely not without uh, acknowledging that we are just part of a, of, a, of a continuum. And that Socrates called techne, and then you hold, you know, the, the rest of the, the, the story. So for me, it was very important to invite not only artists, of course, we have invited artists in this in this meeting, but also data scientists and and, and theorists and people who are like dealing with this question. In, in I mean, theoretically, um, because um, again, I, I think what what the keystone of this reflection is that we are just in between. We 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 are, we humble eye the transition of this. Uh, 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 very complex uh, 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 things that is the attention, from the economy of attention to the, psych the psychology of attention. So, um, there will be different approach during this, uh, this meeting that will go back and forth between a law, justice, uh, emotion, and um, a surveillance, Surveillance, not necessarily uh, linked to the building where we do uh, we are now located at Stasi Central, the former quarter of Stasi. Because again, surveillance, like Shoshana Zuboff explained it very well in her book, not really surveillance. It's uh, behavior extraction and to extract uh, uh, data, uh, harvest them. You need to then sow them. So I'm also very interested to be with you, and I'm also seeing that. New people are coming, which is nice. Um, to address this, the, also the, the the complexity of of these uh, of these terms of this uh, of this key word, key concept, word concept that that we use nowadays sometimes uh, not relevantly. I would, I would finish with. I'd like to thank, of course, all our partners because. Um, not only this symposium, but the whole Biennale could not have been possible with many people, of course. Many people from 
talking about human resources from the Berlin Biennale team, I cannot thank uh, all of them, the huge team, but uh, some of them are here, like June, of course, like uh, I see Gabi, I see Charlotte, I cannot see all of them, but I, I really want to, to thank all these incredible people with whom we've been working on all these, uh, uh, on, the, in, on this event that has last three months. They are also the official partners, of course, that are crucial in any, any project. So I would like to thank the Berliner Hochschule for Technik and Robert uh, Strep, Strepkopti for the great live streaming they did for the conference program of the Biennale and Prater Sound for the whole technical support. I'd like also to thank um, the Open Society, who helped us a lot for these programs, the Bundeszentral für Politische Bildung. They are both tracking their Bundesregierung für Kultur und Medien im Programm, Neustart Kultur. I'd like also to thank the artists who made the very interesting music for the trailer, Joao Polido, who is also part of the of the Biennale. Of course, I'm forgetting many, many people. Uh, the only thing uh, I think we should, uh, we should remember uh, from this Biennale, I'm speaking like this because it's the last event and the Biennale will close on Sunday, so run if you did not have time to see it yet, <laughs> is that I have had, uh, I mean, an incredible experience with this uh, 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 proposal that moving the line is definitely what makes a Biennale and any exhibition uh, 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 sense. It's, the, it, it's raison d'etre. You want to stay be, before the line, don't do exhibition. You want to look at beyond the, the, the horizon line, then indeed create a uh, spaces, rooms for meetings, however we, you, 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 we are different, we are interested by different uh, fields of research, etc. And for me, this question of, uh, of, uh, of the experience is definitely what we need to care the most. Again, what we need to really like protect from, maybe I will have some people who will <laughs> disagree here, but I've always been someone of of debate and dialogue from this disappearance that technology and particularly uh, algorithmic governance is like handlessly enhancing every day, keeping us between, uh, in front of our laptop, one day just connected without any screen, just with our glasses or jacket, whatever, but keeping us away from this individuation that we are living here, building a collective individual. However, we disagree or not, we still are individuals. And for me, this, this, this proposal, and from the programs to the exhibition, has definitely um, uh, tried to, to care about the, the, this common ground that we need to, to protect. So I will hand here uh, and give the mic to my wonderful colleague and co-curator, and then the mic is yours and the stage is yours. Thank you, Kader, and uh, I would like also to extend a thanks to Kader. It's been a wonderful experience, and to other uh, members of the team, June Trevet, and I see here Sarah and Annika and Christoph and Gabi, of course, and Georgina. So thanks to all the members of the Berlin Biennial. Uh, I would like to start by introducing the first speakers, uh, Dr. Katrin Becker is a research fellow in law and culture at the University the School for Studies of Social Sciences in, an, um, in Paris at the University of Luxembourg and at the Center George Simmel. Uh, her research focuses on relationship between the subject and the institutional system, the legal and linguistic foundations of subjectivity and culture, the role of literature and aesthetics in culture and law, and in particular on new technologies such as blockchain technology and their impact on traditional notions of subjectivity, institutions, and law. Becker's article appear in numerous academic journals, and her first book on literature as the voice of law was published in 2016. 
Recently, she published an article with Jan Lassig, who will also join us later today, on the social and legal implications of blockchain technology 2022. And after Katrin, we will hear our keynote speaker, Evgeny Morozov. Evgeny is an American writer, researcher, and intellectual from Belarus. He received his PhD in History of Science from Harvard University in 2018. Since then, he has lectured regularly at university programs and cultural centers and has developed teaching and mentoring activities. Morozov's writings have appeared in various newspapers and magazines around the world, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, The Economist, The Guardian, and The New Yorker. In 2019, he founded the Syllabus, an online platform that searches thousands of, videos of video channels, podcasts, magazines, newspapers, academic journals, and other digital repositories. And most recently, he founded the Crypto Syllabus in 2022 to understand the many of the phenomena subsumed under the term crypto. Um, I would like to welcome both of you to the stage. And again, thank you everyone for joining us for this. Uh, does this work? Yes. Um, I just will try to get set up. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kader and Noam, for the, um, the introduction and for um, inviting me to take part in this um, magnificent program of today. Um, I will talk about uh, blockchain technology um, which uh, and the question of disembodiment, which is um, in so far an interesting topic in the um, topic of today's conference, the digital divide, because blockchain technology uh, is on the one hand um, just the next step um, in um, technological innovation that um, emerged, emerged in the same hubs in the, in the Silicon Valley, where exactly those tech firms emerged that are basically the, the root for uh, that what we call the digital divide. But on the other hand, it, um, blockchain technology um, promises to deliver a, a tool to overcome these uh, structures of dominance or power structures and to basically um, yeah, deliver a tool to overcome the digital divide. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, just a, a quick disclaimer, I'm here only talking about um, uh, public blockchains, so those that are open to anyone um, and are transparent to anyone and not about um, private or permissioned blockchains that are usually used in uh, company context or governmental administration context and are, that actually have a, um, a central entity that controls what's happening on these blockchains. Uh, a public blockchain, for those of you who don't know, um, is uh, a public decentralized forgery proof consensus based register based on cryptography. So basically you can think of it as a book that is of which uh, identical copies are stored on a multitude of computers, on peer-to-peer -peer network computers all over the world. And whenever a new page in this book is written, all the computers are, um, are updated simultaneously. Only that where in a book you're dealing with pages, we're here dealing with blocks that are chained to each other and that contain specific um, alphanumeric information or data that are, that are referring to each other, that's the chaining aspect, and to specific information. Um, the most famous blockchain uh, is Bitcoin, which allows for uh, 
decentralized monetary transactions, so without a central bank that um, makes sure that every, everything's going right. Um, but blockchains enable lots of other decentralized applications um, and that um, thanks to the inherent function of smart contracts. So smart contracts are basically small uh, computer programs um, that uh, function in an if-then manner. Um, so if you and I are uh, concluding a smart contract, that means that if I or if, if a certain uh, or if the determined uh, amount of money or of crypto money arrives on my account, the uh, digitized object or the internet connected object that I'm, I promise to sell you will automatically uh, be transferred to your ownership. And um, based on this function on, of these smart contracts, the idea is to uh, enable uh, what is called the self-sovereign identity. So, so to enable the subject, the individual, to uh, manage their data independently of any central um, entity to be more autonomous, but um, at the same time it's also meant to be used on, on a social level in so-called decentralized autonomous organizations. And um, these DAOs are, are basically blockchain-based systems, here I quote Kelsey Nebben, that enable people to coordinate and govern themselves mediated by a set of self-executing rules, these so-called smart, smart contracts, deployed on a public blockchain. Uh, in what follows, I want to point out to what extent I think that blockchain technology doesn't only um, rely on decentralization, but also what I call uh, disembodiment. And to what, I, to what extent I think that this is partly utopian, and on the other hand, short-sighted, so myopian, and that this idea of disembodiment will basically turn out to be the stumbling block at which blockchain technology might or will fail. Uh, when I talk about disembodiment, I think of different kinds of bodies that are all interrelated. Um, so, as you can see in the inner shell, the, the body of the subject that at birth enters the institutional system and is right away um, subjected to the corpus of law and becomes part of the body politic. So these are the two institutional bodies. Those two institutional bodies are again based um, on, or they rely on certain ideologies, values, visions of the world that again form a sort of corpus. Um, and all these bodies are meant to be replaced by the decentralized uh, fluid structure of blockchain. So um, in the following, I will take a look at these four different levels of disembodiment, starting with uh, the ideological body. Um, so the idea is basically that given that blockchain protocols are um, number-based, um, there's no, I mean, numbers are neutral, that's the idea. So basically, um, every uh, blockchain can, uh, in a consensus moment, um, program the values that are, uh, that are specific to the, to the respective context. Um, so they are, the, the blockchain circles are, spe are speaking of uh, value sovereignty. Uh, this is myopic in, a, in that sense, as we need to see that each innovation comes with a set, and here I'm quoting Baudrillard, each innovation comes with a set of images, metaphors, signs, and is thus the reflection of a whole vision of the world. And in that sense, we can think of uh, blockchain technology being part of um, what Evgeny Morozov has coined as solutionism, technological solutionism. So the idea that every complex social situation can be defined as a problem and uh, yeah, a problem that can be um, solved with the right technology. Another ideology that blockchain uh, technology could easily be um, seen as being part of is uh, the governance by numbers as, um, as it was coined by uh, Alain Supio. Th that's the idea of the um, that, or that's basically the belief in the power of numbers 
uh, and the calculation as the basis of society, of uh, subjectivity and of law. And that involves the dream of a society without heteronomy, where the law and the state are considered as ruses of power and infringements on the sovereignty of individuals. Um, I will skip that. The um, second level of disembodiment is the idea of replacing political institutions by the blockchain. So the idea is that we're not bound, or these, not we, but the, the um, DAOs, so the blockchain societies basically, um, that they are not bound to a specific body politic, but the, they are governed by the blockchain, so by the automatically executed immutable code. And given the fact that uh, blockchain code is consensus-based and transparent, the idea is that this kind of governance is more democratic, more sovereign and more just. Uh, and yet the, the aspect of governing of governance, of course, um, implies a second level of governing, um, which is the moment of programming, which is all the more important, given that um, the idea of uh, being governed by the blockchain can only then be more actually more de democratic, more sovereign and more just if the moment of programming or the person who programs the blockchain protocol um, acts accordingly. So here the idea is basically to um, mirror the technological decentralization on the governance, uh, decent, uh, on the governance level. So um, as we can see in this um, quote by De Filippi and Wright, um, this would go through voting mechanism and um, uh, tokenized votes, for example. Um, Yet this, again, I would see is myopic to the, to the extent that uh, obviously human society can never be uh, completely predicted. There are always unpredictable circumstance, circumstances that are coming up and that undermine the algorithmic um, prediction and um, that actually need for ongoing political governance. And now to not to contradict the idea of blockchain te technology, that would mean to the, that would mean that we would have to deal with um, yeah with these uh, uh, unforeseen circumstances in a way that doesn't involve the creation of new central steering uh, entities. So in a way to to govern through polycentric, fluid cloud structures and non corporations in a way or non bodies. And that, of course, is very challenging and hasn't really succeeded yet, which um, means that, unsurprisingly, behind this discourse of um, decentralized and democratic governance, uh, we are actually witnessing that in lots of these DAO contexts, there are a few influential actors who are controlling the network and often to further their own interest. However, um, especially in the um, context of commons and cooperative uh, movements, there are lots of promising projects that um, are actually trying to overcome the neoliberal and capitalist ideology at the core of blockchain technology and use the, blocks, lo the blockchain instead um, for um, governing social settings um, according to democratic ideas. And yet, even there, I would think that the the fact that they lack the link to a territory, that the, the fact that they are cloud communities, um, remains problematic with regard to democracy. And here um, I quote Jacques Rancière, who says that uh, the essence of politics is the demonstration of dissent. And it is actually the contingency of our space-time presence that forces us to agree on a common worldview with those with whom we share our existence with. So actually it's only in the involuntary physical togetherness that we are forced to agree with people whose worldview differs from ours. And in that sense, you could say that territory, the link to the territory is in a way a precondition uh, of democracy. Plus another aspect is that um, the em emergence of values that go beyond the purely calculable um, rely at least to a certain extent on physical proximity and here i quote simon veil 
who says that the aspiration to solidarity, for example, presupposes a certain thickness of the terrain. Um, Blockchain-based communities now uh, proudly announce their voluntary and opt-in nature. And uh, of course, given that people gather together to build these um, blockchain uh, societies for a specific purpose, uh, implies that they, there is a pre-established worldview to them. So then we would need to ask, is it, is it possible that um, these value bodies that are implied there, that they change if there's, not, if there's none of this thickness that I just mentioned and if um, the constellation of the members keeps changing uh, with members coming from different uh, world, worldly backgrounds, etc. That's one question we need to ask. The other question would be um, with regard to the idea of uh, democracy. How can we avoid homogenization and thus de-democratization if those who don't agree with these worldviews anymore can just leave and build their, no, their own uh, or a new community? Plus, we need to see that I think uh, to a certain extent there is already homogenization uh, taking part, uh, uh, taking place, given that uh, we need to bring lots of technological skills to deal with blockchain, with crypto wallets, with tokens, etc. Um, the third level of disembodiment is the idea to, um, yeah, to create a sort of law that is independent of national jurisdictions. So that means, on the one hand, that we can. Uh, conclude contracts with people we don't know uh, according to um, ideas of legality that we can come up with ourselves. Um, and at the same time, another phenomenon um, that we can act, uh, currently witness uh, as a very successful phenomenon is the um, uh, are those so-called uh, protocols of decentralized justice. Um, the most famous ones are Kleros and Dior. Um, if that's the way you pronounce it in English. Um, so here the idea is to, um, to entrust matters of law, so especially conflicts that arise in, in the context of smart contracts, um, to a decentralized entity instead of to corruptible, to corruptible judges. So, um, for example, with Kleros, there, there's a pool of anonymous volunteers, uh, volunteer jurors around the world who... Um, obtain the data uploaded by the parties to a contract and who then decide um, on the fair and honest outcome of the, uh, of the conflict and who are financially incentivized to vote. So basically they can double the stake um, they have to put in to become jurors in the first place. Uh, this raises numerous questions, and that's actually a project that I work on with uh, Jean Lasec, but one question I want to focus on here is the question of whether law can actually be uh, decentralized. And this refers especially to that dimension of law that I call here uh, law with a capital L, uh, which, are, which, is, or which contains those dogmas, values, ideas of what is right and what is wrong, what is just and what is unjust, um, that basically underlies um, the understanding or the common meaning of, a, of any community. Um, these decentralized juries that I just talked about basically um, claim to, uh, to establish a sort of fluid decentralized law, but then we would have to ask what kind of, what conception of justice is um, is part of this idea of a decentralized law. When there's no deliberation anymore, in the sense, again, of this thickness between the jurors, or also the juror and the parties to a contract, but also no common, no common meaning of what is just and what is unjust, plus when financial gain and matters of justice are conflated, which is, which is clearly the case when they are in, um, financially incentivized to take part, and last but not least, when uh, justice is basically turned into a calculable concept. Which brings us to the last level of disembodiment, uh, the idea um, to liberate the individual from 
the geographical and bodily constraints. So I'm quoting here Melanie Swan, who says, uh, with blockchain, just because you live in a particular geography should not restrict you to certain government services. So the idea is to have um, uh, yeah, self-sovereign virtual uh, subjectivity or subjects, individuals who can um, yeah, be part of any, and any kind of government context in these so-called DAOs, um, independently of the ter territorial or geographic location and independently of the bodily constraint, body constraints. Um, so, in a way, yeah, that liberates the, the individual from its body, body constraints, but um, at the same time, that also means that the, uh, the body is actually excluded from the blockchain world. And it's, it's basically the body is left behind in, in, a, in a world with a different uh, representation orders. Uh, so basically, uh, maybe the body still is part of the traditional institutional system, whereas the mind is part of uh, the uh, DAO. Um, and that's noteworthy, especially because um, in contrast to the digitized or the digitization so far, blockchain is not only about economy anymore, but also about law and politics which then means basically that we're seeing a disintegration of um, the unity of body and mind, that our, um, our traditional polit political and uh, legal system is based upon. And that's all the more problematic uh, with regard to the Internet of Things, which means that um, the blockchain legal and political order can more and more reach into into the realm of the presence. Um, if you think of automated doors, internet-connected guns, or internet-connected cars or robots, which easily um, yeah, lets you think of dystopian scenarios where the body of, an, of a self-sovereign virtual individual is suddenly being confronted to um, a robotized presence of uh, of an object that belongs to a completely different uh, legal and political order. So basically, yeah, you have these uh, not only clashes of different orders, uh, different blockchain orders, but also the clash between uh, yeah, the, the order of the presence, what I call it here, and the order, the order of uh, the blockchain world. Um, so in that sense, um, Blockchain intensifies the tendency that is already there with uh, digitization, that it, that it invisibilize, invisibilizes certain bodies, um, like here I'm referring to uh, those workers that manage to, or that help to uh, keep the click society alive, um, but who don't take part in the virtualization of life, but are uh, indispensable for it. And at the same, but at the same time, blockchain technology goes further in basically um, initiating an all-encompassing exclusion of the body that uh, remains outside in the so-called meat space. Uh, that's what what it is called, interestingly enough. Um, so, in my opinion, um, I think blockchain. Uh, will not be able to overcome the, the defaults of digitization as long as it doesn't, doesn't make an effort to, um, yeah, to work at this exclusion or to overcome this exclusion of the body. Because um, if you look at the blockchain, or at the core features of blockchain technology, uh, you can basically see that they contradict all the elements that we uh, refer to when we talk about justice. And uh, in my opinion, so uh, blockchain technology would have to give up at least one of its core features to, uh, to make it able to speak of blockchain justice, which then again lets us wonder, do we need a blockchain then or wouldn't it lose um, yeah, the, its utility uh, at all as a technology if it has to give up one, one or more of its core features? Thank you very much.
timer. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming, despite this being far and competing with many other events happening in Berlin this week. Um, let me dispel some fake news that you've heard. I'm not actually American, despite the accent, uh, so you'll have to bear with uh, <laughs> uh, this. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I normally don't actually read my talks, but since I've been asked for to help the translators and interpreters interpret it, and since I tend to get carried away with jokes and side remarks and whatnot, I decided that for this pretty complex subject, I'll actually write my talk, so bear with me, I'll have to um, look at my notes every now and then. So without further ado, uh, let me jump straight into it. And just maybe one last warning before I get to the substance. Um, normally, I tend to give this very dark, dystopian um, outlooks, but uh, you know, recently the competition has become so tough that I've decided to move into the utopian space. Um, so uh, today will be a little bit more optimistic, and I will try to actually speculate on what I've called in the title of this talk, uh, Techno Utopias uh, Beyond Solutionism. And Catherine did me a favor by actually talking a little bit about this concept that I've introduced um, almost a decade ago, solutionism, and I'll get back to what it means. So um, let me start. Um, let's be honest. Uh, who today has the luxury to worry about big tech and things like algorithmic governance? The list of more pressing concerns is already embarrassingly long. The highly destructive war in Europe and the associated humanitarian catastrophe, the devastating energy crisis, the skyrocketing inflation, the lack of meaningful action on climate change, this prospect of Donald Trump returning to power, the near certainty of a far-right party winning the upcoming elections in Italy. This list could be infinite. Remember when our main anxieties had to do with fake news, content farms in Macedonia, and the dark machinations of Cambridge Analytica and like-minded startups. Many of us would probably pay to travel back to those calm and quiet times if you compare it to today's. Measured against the recent horrors, a future dominated by Alphabet and Amazon, as well as their supposed disruptors in the world of crypto and Web3, may not even look that bleak. As public enemies go, the proverbial tech bros are certainly as obnoxious as they are badly dressed. And that's certainly one reason to dislike them but they're almost certainly not the worst of the bunch, except perhaps for Elon Musk, and certainly that dark venture capitalist prince that is Peter Thiel. I mean, which of you haven't looked into expanding your longevity by experimenting with blood transfusions from the young? Peter Thiel certainly has. But apart from this two, the world has certainly many other villains to choose from. The tech universe doesn't certainly have a monopoly on them. Few have taken note of this, but as the world got beset by all the recent problems I've described at the outset, the so-called tech clash, a funky new term meant to capture the growing public backlash against the big tech, has somehow passed into oblivion. Just a few years ago, it was all the rage, topping everyone's list of concerns. Respectful publications like the Financial Times or The Economist, and in Germany, of course, newspapers like FAZ, had an infinite supply of editorials on the subject of the tech clash. It seemed that everyone was angry about fake news, tech billionaires, and the pilfering of our personal data. Today, however, tech clash seems no more. It died a quiet death, at least in the public sphere. What happened to it? Where did it go? Did it succumb to the pandemic, drowned by the endless stream of news about masks and hospital and baths from Wuhan? In a sense, the deflation of the moral panic around big tech was something of a second coming of the end of history. Just like with capitalism at the end of the Cold War, we seem to have accepted, with much resignation of course, that the ways of living and being that are designed and operated by the big tech are here to stay. Just like with the long COVID, all we can hope for is to find ways of coexisting with this enemy. If at least for some of you, this sounds like a minor dystopia in the making, there is also some good news. 
This dystopia comes with a tech utopia of its own. Whatever the problems associated with our growing reliance on private digital infrastructures, we are constantly assured that they are resolvable. If only we stop criticizing and get our hands dirty and start building, as the saying goes in the Web3 world, or at least regulating. So while today's things may be bad, making them better, we are assured, is possible and doable, we just need to be more pragmatic. In short, whatever the excesses of a world dominated by Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg, they can be mitigated. Conversely, whoever is not already on board with this fixable techno-utopia is almost automatically dimmed to technophobe. So everything is fixable, and if you are pragmatic enough, uh, these minor blemishes of the techno-dystopia can actually be turned into a utopia of sorts. So what is the exact content of this pragmatic techno-utopia I've been describing. Having looked at it closely for several years, I can discern three major pillars that undergird it. It's grounded in, first of all, our excessive faith in the ability to regulate these commercial entities. Second, in our naive belief that having these firms compete with each other is the way to maximize innovation. And finally, in our unreasonable expectation that technology platforms could also be the vehicles for the perverse form of business-friendly humanitarianism that in my earlier work I have dubbed solutionism. In short, the pragmatic techno-utopia of today rests in our face in the magic powers of regulation, competition, and solutionism. Let me briefly address each of the three. Um, thus, the first pillar of this consensus that I've described rests on the powerful conviction that the power of big tech could be curtailed through new regulations and rules, like, for example, the right to be forgotten, or the rule for data mandates that would force the tax platforms to share the data that they have been hoarding with other companies and the general public as well. As a result, we are assured the Wild West of the early digital culture and economy can finally be brought under the wise tutelage of the state. The rules of the game, as the saying goes, could finally be laid down, uh, extra profits could be taxed, new labor regulations for the gig economy could be established. I don't have much to say here except to flag that to view this as an answer to the problems, or as the neoclassical econo economists would like to call them, the externalities of the big tech and its operations, um, is to miss the fact that it has been precisely the regulatory state itself that has been preaching the liberalization of labor regulations, the dismantling of antitrust and anti-monopoly regulations, the lowering of taxes, and so on. So while regulation can fix many of the issues that are correctly identified as problematic, the political subject to push for the right regulations seems to be amiss. Public opposition to big tech, which gave us this tech clash, a buzzword that proved dead on arrival, won't magically bring it into existence. The second pillar of this new techno-utopian consensus rests on the assumption that the sheer creative, disruptive, and competitive spirit of capitalism could eventually erode the monolithic power of these firms. And not only that, if only we managed to make the digital economy more competitive, plenty of beneficial consequences would follow. Perhaps data portability, perhaps compensation for user data, perhaps new services of all sorts, that the lazy digital monopolies of today do not want to launch because they have no incentives. Thus, the expectation is that whatever their size and the might of the lobbying operation in Washington or Brussels, technology giants too can be disrupted. And by something more democratic or at least populist, more decentralized and lean. This, of course, is the promise of the crypto world and of Web3, which gives us the dramatic story of the old disruptors themselves being disrupted by the new ones. But it's also the promise of some venture capitalist savior, for example, the new soft bank and its massive vision fund that could come out of the woods and profoundly reshape the tech landscape. Wouldn't it be nice for them to fund some revolutionary technologies that would loosen the grip of Google and Facebook and Amazon? It's worth pointing out, perhaps, that if we need to be saved by venture capitalists, perhaps we should reconsider the benefits of perishing. This phase in competition rests on quite a bit of wishful thinking. The main players of the so-called big tech have so much free cash at their disposal that they can afford 
and they frequently do, to simply buy up all of the existing competitors, along perhaps with the venture capitalists that fund them. The metaverse, once the derelict of venture capitalists, was all cool and new and emancipatory, and then Mark Zuckerberg showed up wearing his ugly t-shirts. This doesn't sound very utopian to me, but this is a normal state of affairs in this milieu. Another quick digression. Perhaps we ought to reflect on whether competition is really as great as everyone says. Do we really want to have 10 of the world's largest AI companies, each dumping $10 billion a year on R&D to develop what are essentially identical capabilities for recognizing objects, images, text, and voice? Isn't it one area where a centralized approach, treating some of these capabilities as public goods, would deliver uh, shared benefits to many more players and at a fraction of the cost. There is no higher rationality emerging from capitalist competition. Often it's actually quite irrational in its outcomes, even if the individual capitalists are doing what's rational for them. This at any rate is something that both Marx and Weber in different ways have taught us. There is no reason to forget it, of course. So regulation and competition, as I've been describing them, are just two of the three components of this pragmatic tech utopia that is being sold to us as a solution to the dystopia itself. The third component, solutionism, rests on the perverse hope that big tech itself, with enough moral persuasion, could be turned into a positive force in the world. With all the artificial intelligence and, that, and other data-related reaches under tight control, the technology platforms could at least be asked to use their immense might for good. Can they assist in finding the cure for cancer, eradicating disease, eliminating world hunger, and whatnot? Perhaps one day, even the bloodthirsty Peter Thiel can be domesticated and introduced to the charms of a tofu-based diet. We are all allowed to dream, right? I first wrote about it a decade ago, but this solutionist stuff is still with us. If back then it was primarily manifested in an infinite string of humanitarian hackathons, often held under the lofty auspices of the United Nations, today it's to be seen in the world of Daos, that Katrin briefly mentioned in her talk. This logic has spread far beyond the world of technology. Now even asset managers want to save the world by giving us an opportunity to invest in some, into some ethically and morally sound stock index. It's truly an effortless and frictionless utopia. In the best of cases, we can go about our peaceful bourgeois existence, punctuated as it is by flat whites, avocado toasts, and yoga sessions, something that you should know pretty well in Berlin, all while contributing something to positive social change, often without even noticing it. If two or three decades ago, it was only consumption that was ethical, today no activity can afford not to be. Investing, communicating, perhaps even sleeping, there is always a more ethical option available via some slick digital app. And of course, there is soon a stock index of some kind attached to it that you can also invest in. Regulate, innovate, solve problems. This is our own mini tech utopia of today. It has achieved a nearly hegemonic status. It's definitely not the wild cyber utopias of the early 1990s with their promise of a world peace by means of virtual reality. In fact, no one talks about virtual sex anymore, an interesting indication of just how far and how greatly our initial ambitions have shrunk. Today's techno-utopia is far more pragmatic and not only grounded in actual, and only grounded in actual, not virtual reality. But it's actually proud of it, hoping to design some algorithmic protocol that would cleverly allow to offset carbon emissions by means of the blockchain. Mark Zuckerberg's pining for the metaverse is more of an exception that proves the rule, the result of a middle-life crisis of someone who clearly missed the wild cyber utopianism of the early 90s. The hegemonic aspect of this pragmatic techno-utopia is very important. Whatever ideological differences might exist between the old big tech of Facebook or Amazon or Google and the new small attack of crypto and Web3, they ultimately buy into the same package of regulation, competition, solutionism. At the height of the tech clash a few years ago, Mark Zuckerberg even complained that Facebook wasn't regulated enough, 
begging Congress for new rules. So what's not to like about this utopian future? One can criticize such pragmatic utopias on many grounds, of course, not least their lack of efficacy, their tendency to overpromise and underdeliver, the excessive reliance on financial mechanisms and other incentives to accomplish social objectives. But these are not the kinds of criticism that I would like to advance today, even though they are, of course, important and must continue to be made. No, my main beef with these techno-utopias is that they're extremely boring, unimaginative, and at the end of the day, deeply conservative in their political outlook. Given my past critiques of cyber-utopianism, I thought I'd never be saying this, but here I am. I actually prefer my techno-utopias wild and radical. But what we have in front of us today is rather meek and pathetic. Wild and radical, it definitely isn't. Let me backtrack a little. For a long time, almost 15 years, ever since I started writing about the tech industry, I thought that the main problem with Silicon Valley crowd and its cheerleaders in the rest of the world was their excessive, was their excessive utopianism. Today, I'm not so sure. I think the main problem is that our own techno-utopianism of today is shallow, thin, and ultimately cannibalistic on the market utopias that undergird neoliberal ideology. And this cannibalistic aspect, I think, is very important uh, as it relates to neoliberalism itself. So even to call it utopianism is a bit of a stretch. Mostly it's just a way to package the basic tenets of neoliberal thought into the supposedly neutral language of innovation, disruption, and governance. This stuff passes for utopia only because it involves latest technologies and is extremely naive about how the real world, you know, the stuff of multi-billion asset managers, the CIA and sovereign wealth funds actually works. Here then is one of the main ideas I'd like you to take away from this talk. Today's scale down and pragmatic tech utopianism is really yesterday's neoliberalism by other means. And neoliberalism, despite what it preaches about disruption, is actually an extremely conservative ideology. For all its embrace of creative disruption, it's actually firmly opposed to any organized effort to stimulate and produce innovation that does not come from market mechanisms. Sorry, that does not come from non-market mechanisms. So here comes another soundbite. The pragmatic utopia that's preached by big tech and Web3 alike is not at all different from what some of you know as neoliberal dystopia. These are just two sides of the same coin, pun intended. Much here, of course, depends on how one defines neoliberalism. I work with a very peculiar definition, which, as they say, needs to be unpacked. I see it primarily as an effort to reshape how innovation happens in society by shifting all of it into the market sphere and blocking or outright neglecting its production in the non-market spheres. Here, I'm defining neoliberalism, so let me maybe underline it once again. So I define and see neoliberalism as an effort to reshape how innovation happens in society by shifting all of it, all of innovation, into the market sphere itself while blocking or neglecting its production in the non-market sphere. And that happens not least because neoliberalists themselves are considered, because non-market spheres, right, these non-market institutions are considered remnants of the past, the bastions of reaction. And I'll talk a little bit more about it as I progress. So I see neoliberalism as an ideology that revolves around one broader point, namely that the institutions of the market offer us the only possible means of achieving large-scale social coordination which in turn allows for progress and human development. On this view, the market offers us the only workable path to problem solving, for managing complexity, and for generating large-scale progressive social change, and particularly important in the last few decades for enabling innovation. In other words, neoliberalism is how society comes to systematically produce novelty at scale. Or that's at least how they would like to think about it um, among themselves. Thus, when the most innovative and consistent defenders of neoliberalism insist that there is no alternative, which is a very frequently mentioned slogan, they don't really mean 
that there are no alternative ways of distributing goods or satisfying hunger, uh, the proponents of neoliberalism no longer argue that markets are always better than governments at allocating resources. Some of them would actually tacitly acknowledge that with big data and artificial intelligence and quantum computing, governments may actually be able to distribute resources as efficiently as Amazon does. So people who are preaching the virtues of fully automated luxury communism, for example, and many related socialist utopias, where Walmart and Amazon offer us a template for some kind of a new planned economy, are mostly fighting futile rhetorical battles. The smartest of neoliberals not actually denying that governments can plan. But markets, at least for the sophisticated neoliberals I've been talking about, do something else that government planning, regardless of how much artificial intelligence you put into it, would never allow. The markets allow the civilization to move forward, to express its creativity, to develop new practices and techniques and institutions. Essentially, they're the means of bringing in novelty into the world and of doing it at scale. And who amongst us is against novelty? And who amongst us has a better institutional program for doing it outside of the market? It's in this sense that the slogan, there is no alternative, uttered by some of the more sophisticated neoliberals, makes sense. My favorite example here is James Buchanan, one of the most controversial neoliberal, neoliberal thinkers who even lauds and celebrates markets as infrastructures of becoming, quote unquote. And this is the exact word that he's using, becoming. This, of course, is much closer to Deleuze than to neoclassical economics. In fact, even Buchanan himself, surprised at some point, um, discovers how much in his thought owes to somebody like White Hat, which, of course, was also a reference point for Deleuze himself. Buchanan in this regard is very interesting because writing in the early 1990s and late 1980s, he actually concedes that computers, and today it would be things like big data and artificial intelligence, might actually help socialism and central planning resolve all those problems of allocating goods, of feeding people, and of providing them with a roof to sleep under. But even if this happens, technologies like those ones still wouldn't help central planners to do anything about this creative problem-solving dimension, these new forms of collective and social learning and of becoming itself. That is, in essence, his argument. The only vehicle for progressivism, defined at least as the reliance on science and technology to move society forward and to institutionalize the new, progressivism is marked is basically market-based neoliberalism. Everything else is mere reshuffling of chairs on the Titanic. There is no other way of delivering on this progressivist promise of using, of using science and technology to move society forward that does not in some way revolve around the market. Right? That's basically the real meaning of there is no alternative quote. Right? It's not about allocating goods. It's not about feeding people. It's about building an institution at the center of society which would allow people to experiment with these different identities and ways of solving problems. This is what, for the hardcore neoliberalism, markets do. And that's why no amount of AI, cloud computing, and artificial and, and uh, you know, big data is going to allow for a new kind of socialism. So, what that means is that big data and AI can be of great help in the socialist mission of chair reshuffling on the Titanic, and we can be doing it in a more egalitarian and more efficient manner, but that's all that they can do as far as any kind of socialism is concerned. Now, let me move to the more concrete and hopeful ways uh, and parts of my talk where I'd like to flag some of the ways uh, that the status quo could be broken and identify also some of the problems with this thinking that there is no alternative um, to market-based civilization. So thinking about alternatives to the current regime and its utopian rhetoric is, of course, extremely hard, as many of you surely know from your own experience. Often this is because this search starts from the wrong premises. Like good hackers, we look at existing technologies, internet search, social networking, the blockchain, cloud computing, and we try to imagine 
how these technologies could be repurposed to serve in alternative projects. Again, as I've said, like all good hackers would do, you look at it and you try to understand how to insert it into a different social order. In reality, though, the institutional and the ideological, ideological contours of this alternative project remain extremely blurry. And that's why so many of us are essentially hitting our heads against the wall. At our most radical best, we are likely to invoke the word socialism, which I already have in this setting, juxtaposing the democratic government of the people to the mostly undemocratic government of the market. But the moment we make this move, the neoliberal chimera returns, unleashing its usual set of arguments about how governments and central planners will never be able to supply us with all these institutional infrastructures that enable progress, learning, innovation, becoming, and whatnot. The subsequent moves for those of us on the left are not many, at least if you look at what has been done rhetorically and historically in the last few decades. Perhaps we can find some middle ground under nebulous concepts like the entrepreneurial state, meekly pointing out that the war in Vietnam had a silver lining of some kind as it eventually gave us the iPhone. Or we can simply amp up the glamour part of it all, promising that once Amazon-like algorithms take care of satisfying our basic needs, we would have all the free time in the world to enjoy the fruits of the fully automated luxury communism. Having thought about this for years now, I've come to believe that this repertoire of responses to the neoliberal challenge is extremely limited. The entire neoliberal project, as it emerged during the Cold War, left a legacy that has greatly affected not only the ideological and political outlooks of its proponents, but also those of its opponents. At the heart of neoliberal ideology lies this dichotomy that I've been referring to through and through my talk today. And this dichotomy is the dichotomy between the market and the state, with its insistence that our only choice in managing complexity, in allocating goods, in producing and institutionalizing novelty is between entrusting them to free willing and creative entrepreneurs or having robot-like soulless technocrats take charge. All the other social units thus are sandwiched somewhere between the market and the state as they are deemed to be either ineffective because they are too small or too archaic because they ultimately are remnants of the pre-industrial civilization. So everything that actually makes life beyond the factory or the supermarket or the gray and faceless office of a local bureaucracy, bearable, exciting, and worth living. You know, the stuff of neighborhoods, squares, libraries, bookshops, citizen associations, evening schools, all of that is deemed either irrelevant, ineffective, or outright harmful. It's part of this no man's land within the state and the market, and we need to either make it part of the state-run bureaucracy, and we need to subject it to the rules of market competition. So innovation thus is deemed to be the product and the consequence of the magic workings of the price system and the market system with their ability to um, work off information that was widely distributed in the individual heads, right? And that's the classic argument of Hayek that essentially why is the market and the price system so good is because they allow us to take advantage of all this distributed knowledge in society that no other system would be able to bring together in one place. And thus, it's the proverbial entrepreneur who, by finding new and better ways of producing, normally brings society forward. There is this heroism of the entrepreneur because he is the connective tissue, if you will, within all these different actors with their distributed information in the system. And it's through this entrepreneurial activity that novelty, traditionally, in neoliberal conception of the world, is discovered, institutionalized, and distributed throughout society. So it's not by accident that somebody like Hayek actually titles one of his most famous essays, Competition as a Discovery Procedure. Right? Competition, it's not there to give you cheap products. Competition, it's there to discover the new, to discover things which society on its own would never actually experience and find out what it is, let alone put it at the center of its social activity. So in the neoliberal imaginary, the entrepreneur thus became something of a presentable and trustworthy equivalent 
of the avant-garde artist who is always experimenting and enacting new and radical forms of the future. But these were not castles in the air that one associates with avant-garde artists. This was the stuff of widgets and consumer products, the stuff you buy in Ikea rather than see in an art gallery. It's not surprising that this paradigm then spread to other domains of social life, so that today we also speak about idea entrepreneurs or political entrepreneurs or, of course, social entrepreneurs. The fact that such entrepreneurization of the social has remained uncontested acquiring a nearly hegemonic status in society is, of course, the consequence of the left's inability to offer a workable alternative, non-market vision, and a model for how novelty could actually be tamed and institutionalized. We can only think about finding and discovering and institutionalizing the new through the prism of the entrepreneurial action, which remains imprisoned in the sphere of the economy. So this alternative conception that would dispense within the entrepreneur and the economic, it wasn't offered in part because many thinkers on the left found these processes already at work in what they called, quote unquote, culture. And here I don't mean the elite culture of art galleries or biennales like this one, but what I mean is the kind of expansive everyday culture that's through the works of people like Raymond Williams, Stuart Hall, or Michel Deserteau in France, form the bedrock of cultural studies. As with so much in academia, um, unfortunately, this discovery of culture, uh, by the academic complex at least, ended up moving this trend of thought of culture being some kind of a counterpoint to economy in a rather arcane and obscure direction, where the goal became showing how the oppressed be they the workers or sexual or racial minorities or the subaltern, managed to heroically resist the cultural and political greeds of their oppressors. So it all became about the glorification of these resistances, even if the early work of someone like Raymond Williams, for example, still tried to make sense of how various institutions of the welfare state, in the case of Britain where he lived, it was the BBC or the Open University or even the NHS, actually contributed to that resistance. Right, so we moved from a stage where we actually try to understand the conditions of possibility for this resistance to a stage where we are mostly celebrating the resistance itself, completely unattentive to the institutional preconditions that made such heroic resistance in the everyday life possible. So the institutional landscape that made such acts of resistance potent was of not much interest to the academics and theorists that followed. They look primarily to language rather than institutions for analytical insights. By and large, theirs became a story of us living in the best of all possible worlds already. At least if only we practiced enough psychogeography and derif in the hopes of turning our everyday life into a battlefield against oppression. It was all there already available within the resources that were offered to us. And this is where the pragmatism of neoliberal thinkers proved far superior. They left it to the likes of Ayn Rand to celebrate the heroic acts of resistance of individual entrepreneurs against stale mass civilization and government bureaucracy, of course. Instead, the small pragmatic neoliberal thinkers like Hayek and Buchanan and many others, they employed their political imagination to try to outline the sort of institutional environment Think of the World Trade Organization, or even the parts of the European Commission, or at least the pro-competition rules that the European Commission emits. They try to think about this institutional landscape that would be most conducive to the flourishing of entrepreneurs and to the flourishing of the entrepreneurial civilization. So that the systematic production of entrepreneurial subjects was anything but less a fair. It was actually a well-organized and well-funded effort. And the neoliberals were thinking not just institutionally, but also infrastructurally. In a world dominated by Google and Amazon, and not to mention Instagram and TikTok, and potentially even by their crypto adversaries, what other choice do we have but to run ourselves and turn ourselves into the entrepreneurs of some kind? So here's a hint for what one of the first building blocks 
of a wild leftist techno utopia might look like. Perhaps we should go back to the idea that there is more novelty and innovation in culture, quote unquote, conceived once again in the expensive sense that someone like Raymond Williams gave to it, than in the economy, which has always been and will always be the favorite terrain and domain of neoliberalism. So here's the second point I'd like you to take home today. The major goal of a post-capitalist, or at least non-capitalist project, whether you call it socialist or communist or something else, is entirely up to you. It should not be to beat neoliberals at the economy, as many previous projects, for example, in the Soviet Union on China, have tried to do. Rather, it should be to show that as far as the Hayekian discovery procedures go, and I mentioned to you previously that he did think of competition as a discovery procedure. So as far as this Hayek and discovery procedures go, the learning and innovation pipeline that is offered to us by capitalist competition is actually relatively weak, costly, and infertile. And perhaps it's actually not the only such pipeline that stares us in the face. The reason why neoliberals manage to convince everyone that competition and markets are the only game in town is because they have always juxtaposed them to bureaucracy and government planning. But the real opposite pole to competition and economy, it's not, of course, government and bureaucracy, it's society and culture. How does all of that relate to technology? And I know that I have to close in five or so minutes, so I'll be accelerating a little bit. So how does all of that relate to technology? Well, our task should be, first of all, to figure out how to build institutions and infrastructures that would allow us to turn the creative spirit at the heart of our culture in this non-elitist and expansive definition into a new source of value and a major factor contributing to social reproduction. That's what the cultural studies as a discipline missed back in the 1970s. Our everyday life is actually pregnant not only with opportunities for resistance, but also with opportunities for innovation and social reproduction that are not in any way inferior and often actually superior to those that one finds in the so-called economy. What follows from this rather abstract framing is that today's neoliberal techno-capitalism doesn't offer us the only framework for systematically producing and institutionalizing innovation and novelty. It might seem a banal and trivial point, but I think it isn't. And let me give you a few examples from everyday life just to, so that you can relate to what I'm saying at the more kind of hands-on level. I think that there hardly passes a day when we don't discover a better or clever way of doing things that we have always taken for granted. Cooking a dish, cleaning up an apartment, learning a foreign language, fixing a broken chair. By nature, we're active beings who thrive on encountering and creatively circumventing unforeseen challenges. In the process of solving these micro-problems that everyday life throws our way, we experience a sense of triumph and mastery. They don't last long. Um, if we are lucky, you might even stumble upon an ingenious way to improve some basic, seemingly internal process that, in retrospect, does appear to take far too much energy and time. But what happens after such discoveries that we do in our everyday life? Most likely, we merely keep using these new techniques and methods to improve our own lives, creating our own little private utopias for ourselves. This is, in most cases, where the social innovation process stops. It stops in our heads and hands, or at best, our households. The potentially socially beneficial methods and techniques that we discover, often without trying, don't get shared widely, not even with our neighbors, or even family members. Why is this so? Well, the barriers to the effective communication and social institutionalization of such discoveries, on a global scale at least, are simply too high. That's why most of us don't even bother formalizing these discoveries in such a way that they could be shared with others. We might write a tweet or post a photo, but that's where such communication usually ends. And this is so for a reason. Our social systems are simply not configured to maximize social innovations conceived or in many cases, merely are nursed by its members. Unless, of course, they are then reinserted into the market system and we have to reinvent ourselves as entrepreneurs. And this is where I'm driving at and what follows. As a result, 
the only available path for scaling up and universalizing such discoveries is via their commercialization through the market. This can undoubtedly produce some of the desired outcomes, leveraging the capitalist quest for profitability in order to make the most obscure and unthinkable products widely accessible in the most remote areas of the globe. Such commercialization, however, also imposes a certain institutional straitjacket on the innovators themselves, forcing them to become startups that work off a business model, no matter how unsustainable and inappropriate for the task at hand such a commercial turn might actually prove to be. And this is a trade-off. What one gains in reach and universality, one is likely to lose in terms of one's flexibility when it comes to alternative forms of social organization. How does this dynamic work in practice? So we make it very concrete at the end, and I have two pages left. Um, suppose that in your everyday practice, you have found a clever way of studying and memorizing words in a foreign language, because you're studying a foreign language, for example. So if you think that your solution is truly revolutionary and will be embraced by thousands of people, you are unlikely to keep it to yourself, using it merely to study all the languages in the world it's far more likely that you will indeed try to scale it up. But under the current institutional environment, there is only one path to doing it in today's world. You are most likely to do it by commercializing your inventions and by raising capital. You will thus spend some time and effort trying to convince others, venture capitalists, sovereign wealth funds, investors, to invest into a new venture so that the initial innovation could go from being a mere prototype to becoming a usable mass product. It's possible, of course, that the stars do align in your favor and a successful product would, in fact, be launched as a result of your discoveries. You will, however, probably have to repay the initial funds that you raised. This would impose a certain business model, most likely built around subscriptions or some combination of data extraction from your users and the subsequent generation of advertising revenue based on that. This will turn your new revolutionary technique for studying languages into a commodity, while also turning you into a corporation. There is nothing new under the sun here. This is how the commercialization of invention has always worked under capitalism. This is also why the well-known defenders of capitalism, like Hayek that I've already mentioned, identified the so-called cash nexus as a vehicle of progress for humanity as a whole. Whatever the local costs for some, for example, inequality or unfairness of outcomes for some participants, the total benefits of this game of capitalism, the total costs and the total benefits, sorry, of imposing economic relations on the previously non-economic and non-commercial contexts and processes are always greater. So the, the benefits here will always outweigh the costs. So what does digitization change in this regard? I would argue that quite a few things. First of all, so many of our actions have suddenly become observable. Thanks to sensors and other types of smart systems that are now ubiquitous in so many spaces around us, most of what we do is now recorded. As a result, more of our everyday life could become subject to reflection and empirically validated analysis. Even in our smart homes, we are constantly invited upon to reflect on trends, patterns, and statistics. Secondly, today, even a trivial amount of technological knowledge and skill gets one much further than it did 10 or even five years ago. Even without learning how to code, we can truly do more with less. On this, the techno-utopias of the 1990s were absolutely correct. However, such augmented resourcefulness is likely to remain a permanent feature of the digital environment, providing ordinary users with the unprecedented, if not always fully realized, powers to act. So this is the good news. The not so good news is that there are also great limits that the structure of today's digital economy imposes on humanity's newly found capacities for reflexivity and transformative action. The greatest of them all is that such capacities are tightly circumscribed within the logic of the digital platforms and the apps that populate them. Whatever social discoveries that I've described before are made by the newly empowered self-reflexive agents and groups, that is, users, must fit into that logic with the associated imperatives to monetize user data, charge subscriptions, share revenue with the platform itself. So this market-based model could and does produce some benefits, but should it be the only template for organizing how digital society operates and institutionalizes social innovation? Should every person who, in learning languages digitally, discovers an even better way of doing so, 
be forced to choose between doing nothing, which is what happens in 99% of cases, or becoming an entrepreneur? Doesn't this one-size-fits-all solution eventually come to restrain the institutional repertoires that are available for problem solving? And wouldn't a proper non-capitalist system seek to find ways to enrich our repertoires of action in society and culture, rather than in, in the market itself, and do so in a way that the new techniques and methods that we discover while acting are shared as widely as possible? Now, in conclusion, let me emphasize the key point of my talk. We must choose our utopias carefully. Today's technologies are extremely powerful, and we need to make sure that we dream big. We can, of course, end up with something pragmatic, ending up in a world where uh, the current model is secured. We can hope that regulations, competition, a heavy dose of solutionism that I described at the beginning uh, would somehow tame the big tech and make it bearable, or at least its effects bearable. This, however, would betray the radical potential that many digital technologies do offer us without ever trying to understand where earlier generations of utopians, some of them socialist and some of them not, made mistakes, and they made plenty of them. A much better move, it seems to me, would be to accuse capitalism of a scene that it cannot really stand to tolerate. That is, we need to proclaim that capitalism systematically under-innovates. It's basically guilty of systematic under-innovation. Living under capitalism, we are constantly punching below our weight as a species. To some extent, this was the charge that Marx waged at the capitalist system. But if Marx, with his positivist outlook, that was typical of the 19th century, still thought that the way forward was somehow to centrally plan everything and act rationally, a less positivistic socialism of today would probably want to simply create spaces, institutions, and infrastructures where novelty and innovation could flourish, but flourish in non-market conditions. And this, to me, seems like a way to actually produce more innovation than we have ever seen. And what's required is to rediscover the radical potential of culture as a container of this potentially radical behavior. So to me, this seems like the content of a truly radical post on capitalism that I've been describing so far is missing. And it's our task uh, in rethinking the digital utopia, to actually fill them in with this content. And I think if we reflect upon this long and deep enough, we'll see that digital technologies do have a huge role to play. Our problem, however, is the lack of the ideological underpinning with which to actually uh, make them useful. Thank you so much, and sorry that I have spoken a little bit more than I wanted. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Um, thank you, Evgeny, for this uh, great and thought-provoking talk. Uh, I would like to react with some uh, thoughts and questions, and I think afterwards the, the audience is uh, invited to ask some questions. Um, if, I, if I understood you correctly, you're saying two things with, re with regard to the critique of algorithmic governance and digital divides, so the topic of today's conference. So. Uh, firstly, um, the hope or the utopia that can still exist um, with regard or given the world situation we are in um, is basically based on uh, on the three pillars you were mentioned you were mentioning regulation competition and solutionism and the problem with those three pillars is that they are themselves entrenched with the neoliberal neoliberal ideology or they um, basically are a victim to this uh, neoliberal ideology a bit in the sense of Adorno who says that there's no escape of uh, uh, from capitalism everything even the critique falls back into its uh, um, grips on the other hand uh, the resistance that you see in the cultural uh, sphere is um, you're criticizing because it doesn't um, yeah, it basically remains in the oppressive structures and doesn't offer any 
um, yeah, any other means of um, social uh, coordination or other institutions. And that's where you come in with your idea that this is basically the point where we have to think uh, differently, that we use culture uh, or that we realize that culture can actually offer more novelty and innovation than economy. And um, yeah, that we have to overcome this idea that there's uh, that competition and economy um, have to re have to uh, have only the alternative of um, the state and bureaucracy, uh, bureaucracy, but rather society and culture. So I quote you saying that we need to create spaces, institutions, and infrastructures where novelty and innovation c could flourish in non-market conditions. So, uh, with regard to these ideas, if, they, if I understood them correctly, I have uh, three questions that are basically linked to uh, the, the scheme that I showed during my, during my talk, um, starting in the middle with this inner shell, uh, um, the actors, and then around the actors, the institutional um, platform, and then the ideology. So, Starting with the ideology, if, if we think or if we try to think that we have to come up with um, uh, or that we have to offer people a new, a, a new scheme for innovation that is not anymore in the name of financial gain, um, do you have any, I, I, I mean, yeah, like I said, every technology or every every society always has a certain ideology, ideological basis. And if there's, if it's not the economic, um, the economic incentive anymore, do you see any, any alternative? Um, because people, people who innovate or who are, uh, who sh who are supposed to be incentivized to innovate, basically have to do it for a specific purpose purpose and if it's not the financial gain anymore what could it be so usually if it's not that in other contexts it would be a belief in something so um sure okay um let me try to maybe be more concrete than i was in my remarks was what i'm trying to say here so essentially if you look at liberalism traditionally historically Forget about neoliberalism. Look at liberalism as it takes up in the 18th, 19th century. It basically legitimizes itself by saying that there is a threat, and the threat is that we are going to fall back into feudalism. We are going to remain trapped in a society where we're not using the infrastructures that we have, you know, the means of production that we have, to generate maximum product because people are slacking off. You have this, uh, you know, feudal lords in charge. They are basically sitting on the laurels, and we need to build a system where we have voting, we have people deciding on certain things, and we try to build markets. And these markets would not be subject to some kind of intervention by feudal powers and so forth. This is the project of liberalism. It's concerned primarily about relapsing into the feudal past. At some point as communism and socialism gain in power in 1930s, you have a sudden shift, and you suddenly start worrying about the future. You no longer worry about the past. You start worrying about, okay, now you're gonna have a completely different system that will be capitalism on steroids, but with a somewhat different ideological sign, and it will be socialism. And what's the promise of socialism? We're gonna take the means of production, we're gonna scrap class relations that prevent their full realization, and we're gonna build a much more efficient system of building the economy, and that system will be called socialism. What do neoliberals say? They say, okay, who cares about feudalism anymore? We're in a new age, and we need to worry about the future. And the future, if we don't intervene, will be, capital, will be socialist. And it will be basically what capitalism does, but better. And against this playground, what do neoliberals say? They basically tell you that, look, this plan, it's not gonna work, because there are certain facets of how we discover novelty, how we discover innovation, that no amount of government planning is going to unearth. You would need to have the market as the mechanism of coordinating behavior in society for this novelty that will bring us to the next stage to be truly discovered. And they're basically saying, look, what socialists are promising you, it sounds great, it's never gonna work in practice. 
Against this background, what I'm saying is that it was a nice framework to think about the Cold War. Today, who cares? I mean, there are plenty of ways in which we generate new things and we coordinate. You know, when you go and pick up your kids from kindergarten and you coordinate with your partner who's going to do that, it's not like you're running an auction and you're deciding which of you is going to pay the most to decide who's going to do that. No, you coordinate, and you coordinate with each other, not through the price system and the market mechanism. You do it by using digital technology itself. I mean, it's a very simple thing. And when I talk about culture, I don't mean culture in the sense of engaging in artistic capacity. I mean culture as the residue of all human behavior, the way anthropologists think about it. So in that sense, yes, we are all embedded in culture, we're all doing things, we're all motivated by different reasons, and we're all re leaving certain residues, creative residues because we invent new ways of doing things, we leave you know, artistic residues, we leave intellectual residues. The current digital infrastructure that has emerged is not acting upon those residues. They are not being turned into something that can benefit humanity and large, could benefit our community. It, they're basically lost. The only way in which we act upon them is if the institutions of capitalism somehow intervene and they start creating schemes in which entrepreneurs are incentivized you know, to go and follow you on your phone and understand that the way you move around the city leaves a data trace and this data trace can be packaged and sold to some company. So then emerges a service and this becomes a real thing and it's no longer a residue. So this potentiality becomes reality, but it becomes reality within the framework of capitalism and not something else. And all I'm saying is that, you know, you don't necessarily need conscious innovation. So you don't need to have people who are sitting there and thinking, okay, I'm not going to build this because I want to help refugees. I mean, it's great if that happens. But all I'm saying is that in our everyday life, in our existing social collectives, whatever motivates us, you know, it could be because we have a crush on somebody and we're doing something, or it could be because we are traumatized, or it could be because we genuinely want to help solve the climate crisis. I don't care why people do these things, but I know that 99% of truly creative action that exists in society currently just booms, it disappears into the void. And our institutions are not configured to take advantage of this action, and uh, our technologies and infrastructures are not. And you know, against this background, what do socialists tell you? They tell you, oh, okay, great that this happens, but that's not our department. Our department is to understand what the human needs are and satisfy them, and after we've satisfied them by using big data, AI, cloud computing, and what have you, maybe we can start thinking about this creative stuff. Because for us, this creative stuff is secondary. You know, it's what in the conventional kind of Marxist framework they describe as the difference between the realm of necessity and the realm of freedom. And you know, what do most Marxists who think about technology think? You know, they think, okay, technologies, where do we use them? Well, we use them to satisfy basic needs. We basically roll them out to solve the problems that exist in the realm of necessity. And the realm of freedom, we'll be lucky if we ever get there. You know, <laughs> it's not our department. What I'm saying is that, you know, I didn't even get to this in my talk because it was already too long. This distinction between the realm of necessity and the realm of freedom might not actually be valid. Uh, it's a mistake to be fixating so much on necessity. And it's a mistake not to be trying to be finding ways in which our existing behavior that's generative of value of some kind, that's not capitalist value, it just disappears. Why shouldn't people concerned with socialism, or at least non-capitalism, not be thinking of institutional infrastructural environments for harnessing that and harvesting that? So, you know, I'm not here proposing a policy program that where the European Commission will set up a $10 billion fund to, you know, fund innovation from culture. <laughs> like, no. Um, it's a more subtle and more theoretical program which basically goes to the heart of what I think is wrong with conventional socialism as it has been conceived in opposition to capitalism. Right? But anyway, I don't, maybe it's too much to no, no, digest I, in a no, single no, afternoon. I, I just still think that the, the matter of scaling up these little, these little innovative uh, situations that you're referring to is the biggest question. So there would, there would have to be some sort of a, idea of how to create an institutional platform, but that's something that you don't, you, you put it out in the world and then hoping that socialists will come up, no, no, or, no, or but, do you have an idea? Uh, but I mean, first of all, you need to at least have somebody 
cognizant of the fact that they need to be built. Mm -hmm. Right now, you talk to most people who think about alternatives to capitalism, if these people, you know, these people are not many, to be honest, for, for various reasons. Many of them still fall into the traditional socialist mentality that tells you, okay, the traditional factors of production have reached a certain efficiency, you know? So you look at Google, you know, what do socialists tell you? Oh, Google, yeah, great, it's there, it organized all of the world's data. Now we just need to nationalize it, or we need to tax it, or we need to put a socialist fact, a flag on top of it. So the institutional design of capitalism is accepted. You're just thinking that maybe the fact that it, it's tied to advertising prevents it from being truly objective. That's the traditional socialist mentality. What I'm saying, to some extent, is that I see no reason to believe that just because two guys in a basement in Stanford benefited from the Cold War environment, benefited from their connections, benefited from the position of the United States in the geopolitical packing order, and managed to build a company that also benefited the National Security Agency, just because they did all of that, I see no reason to assume that somehow they magically stumbled upon the perfect institutional design of how to organize search needs of people living in Berlin. It's like, if you think about it, it's like the greatest fairy tale ever told to humanity. So that's basically what you're trying to break with your syllabus, right? So you're thinking in that direction. Well, I mean, syllabus to me is just an indication that, you, you, you know, the rhetoric that you hear that you need $10 billion to try to show an alternative model and build an alternative model, and that's the excuse used by many public institutions in Europe that they are underfunded, they don't have $10 billion. I mean, it's false. You can be building it, you can be using an alternative logic, and all of this can be done. My main point in saying what I've been saying before is to basically show that, you know, of course you can build smaller ways of aggregating this insights or this novelties, you know, at the level of the city, at the level of the neighborhood, at the level of the family, at the level of the nation state, you can be scaling it up afterwards. That's not the problem. The problem is to understand that this stuff has value. And of course, capitalists understood it long time ago. It's just that they tap into just one facet of that value, as much as it pertains to advertising, or as much as it pertains to training machine learning models. Mm -hmm. So they understand the value of everyday life, because they're exploiting you, they're looking into your phone every day, they're extracting the data that they need, but they use it in very limited ways. You know, so I'm not advocating here like, you know, Google on steroids, which will deploy the data that they take from you in 300 ways rather than in two. But to some extent, I see no reason not to think about it. What else can be done with that data? And what can be done with the fact that you are innovating, whether you want it or not, when your phone dies and you still manage to recover it and do something with it? I mean, yes, you might think this is trivial, but I'm absolutely sure that this residues of resisting creative behavior, resistive or resisting creative behavior, that we all go through on a daily basis, right now they're lost. Right? And there is no bridge that you can build there from people who are obsessed with alternatives to capitalism because they really think like we are in 1930s, uh, you know, Siberia, and we really need to be building large steel plants to catch up with the United States. And you know, that's the mentality of kind of traditional socialism. And I'm not denying that. If you look at machine learning, the competition for chips, 5G, there are all these geopolitical challenges which require massive amounts of funding, but the fact that we are completely neglecting the soft layer on top, that bothers me a lot. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, I mean, for me, it was always the question of once you do scale up and once you do use the, these data you're talking about or these information that are there on a bigger scale, there's always the question of who is, who is the actor who manages the data and according to what uh, ideology that's something that uh, that will always uh, show up again mm -hmm. I think I mean one last question before I think I'll um, give the word to everybody else um, I mentioned the um, the Commons and cooperative uh, movement what do you think of that is that uh, one could that in your opinion be one way of organizing society in that direction then to have an alternative between the or yeah to break the dichot uh, dichotomy that... I mean, it clearly could be and it should be, and I think, you know, but by, by that logic, you can also say that DAOs should be part of it, because ultimately, you know, who are we to impose institutional limits on what forms of social association should exist in the world? I mean, 
So in that sense, yes, cooperatives and commons should be. What I find problematic about cooperatives uh, seen through the lens of the model I've been outlining is that they're focused either on production or consumption. Mm -hmm. So they're much more uh, grounded in the idea of the economy as being primary, being you know the, <laughs> the base, and the culture being secondary and being you know the superstructure right? okay. in the traditional Marxist vocabulary. And I think that this is just a bizarre model, which you know, of course, there are Marxist debates about whether like this is even a correct way to think about mm -hmm. how economy relates to society and ideology and culture. But uh, what I would like to see more of would be <laughs> cooperatives that somehow tap into the ideological and the cultural sphere and not just into the sphere of production, right? And it's very hard to understand what would that be because maybe political parties do that <laughs> to some extent or political and social movements do that, mm -hmm. right? So ultimately, I mean, my, my, as I've been trying to explain it in my talk, you know, I think the problem with traditional socialism as, an, as a kind of, as a, as a way out of capitalism, it's just too economistic and it's too focused on production, so it's too productivist. But productivist not in the sense of we need to embrace the growth, but productivist in the sense that, in the sense that it ignores all the conditions of possibility that make production possible. And some Marxist theories grappled with that. So somebody like Raymond Williams, who I talked about, mm -hmm. he basically you know, tried to look at uh, culture um, as you know, a precondition to production. But e even that, I think, doesn't go too far because it accepts production as primary and culture as secondary. So yes, you can talk about cultural means of production, non-materialist means of production, all of that is doable. But I think it just reinforces the dichotomy between culture and society, which you know I'm, I'm almost reinforced in my talk. But to separate, to, to present economy as some kind of a counterpart to society that stands outside of it, which is what you know Max Weber does mm -hmm. in his famous book, Economy and Society, it's just wrong. Yeah. And that then perpetuates all these ideas, which then you know end up with us thinking about cooperatives as an economic actor and not as a political or social or cultural one. Okay, and then, yeah, I, I still, th yeah, it would need to be seen how the, how um, the technologies, if the technologies doesn't, don't um, intensify this, this cleavage between economy mm -hmm. and society, but that's, uh, yeah, maybe a different topic, maybe um, somebody else in the, uh, zero minutes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I want to thank both of you, it was fascinating. Unfortunately, because it was so fascinating, we don't have so much time for Q&A, but we have a coffee break outside, we'll take 15 minutes, and you can go in line and ask Evgeny and Katrin questions outside. <laughs> so yeah, and we hope to see you in 15 minutes and we can uh, see you at the break, thanks.
So thanks everyone for uh, joining us again. Um, I want to welcome Kader back to the stage to present the members of our next panel, Algorithmic Surveillance and the Question of Automated Fairness. Thanks, thanks. Please come back for the people who are still enjoying their coffee and something else. Um, I'm waiting a little bit so that few people can start. Yeah, guys, come back. So, in the meantime, I'm going to introduce the two, the three next panels. And, um, so I have the honor to, to start, uh, to introduce you to Shazeda Ahmed, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University Center for Information Technology Policy. She received a PhD at UC Berkeley's School of Information. In 2021, she had first features on Chinese cybersecurity, technology, and internet policy. Beyond that, she recently published on China's emotion recognition market and its implication for human rights 2021, which will, she will, uh, of course, elaborate later with us. She will be on stage with 
Ramak Molavi, a friend first, and a digital rights lawyer and senior researcher. She leads the Meaningful AI Transparency Research Project at the Mozilla Foundation since September 21. She is a visiting lecturer at, uni at, un at the University of Bosdam, an IE Law School in Madrid, and works as a policy advisor in the field of new technologies. Her research includes privacy and data protection, AI and algorithmic systems of ethic and ethics, sorry, and the regulation of technology. Uh, inter interdisciplinary work is dedicated to sustainable and public good-oriented technology. And last but not least, April Williams, who will join us online. She's not with us, but she's probably listening to us right now. Welcome, April. Is assistant professor of communication and media and an affiliate of the Digital Studies Institute at the University of Michigan. Williams is also a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, a faculty fellow at the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study and the Notre Dame Technology Ethic Center, and an affiliated researcher at NYU Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies. So please, Welcome both Ramak Molavi and Shazeda Ahmed. Hi, everyone. Thanks for staying here and um, joining us our, in our computational journey. Um, I'm going to zoom out with you and talk about the term digital divide and give you a whole range of topics, and then we go deep again with Shazeda. This is in South Korea. What you see at the front is, the South, is South Korea. At the back, it's North Korea. And over the Engine River, you see the Freedom Bridge. You can see it here a bit better. And the bridge, during the sunshine policy, people could go and visit their families. At the moment, it's not possible anymore. This is the picture of the Jones Beach in New York, which was opened in the 1920s, and you see it's a super nice park, and you have the facilities, you have a swimming pool at the front, and so on. And this is made by, designed by a very famous architect who did a lot of stuff for New York. This is a bridge that he also designed on one of the most important highways to that park. And it was built in a way that cars could pass, but not buses, like buses from, from uh, low-income parts of, of the city um, bringing Puerto Rican kids and uh, black people to the beach. Whenever you see in your bench uh, arm facilities like this, the primary reason is not to rest your arms, it's to provide homeless people from sleeping on them. So you see, technology like architecture can unite and enable, but it can also divide and be more of a gatekeeper. So. Mostly in the tech era, the harms are not that visible, like in architecture or design. And therefore, they are harder to, to fight. And technology is never neutral, like design isn't. So it's all about motivations and the creators behind. So uh, let's go to the term digital divide. It's the title of our whole day. And this is a breakdown by Jan van Dijk. And I'm taking this. To, to lead you through these are the three parts that we are talking about in the digi digital divide area. So it started in 1995 by uh, probably a journalist who didn't coin that term. And it was first all about access to internet and to information technology. 
We are coming back to that in a minute. So since 20 and 2004, another topic joined that. It was about the skills and the usage, also about the literacy to, uh, to, to take part and to participate. Since 2012, we have also the discussions on the outcomes and impacts. So I don't fully agree that uh, only the two second parts are lasting until now, like Van Dijk says. I think the first part around physical access is still with us. Physical access, it's about uh, the availability of connected devices, about um, having access to the to internet or access to a fast web. And still not everyone has a smart device or internet connection. Now we don't have to go far. In many parts of Germany, you don't have really fast uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> and we saw during COVID that many school kids and homeschooling had to use their mobile devices to work because even their parents didn't have a desktop or something like, uh, like that. So they, the schools provided them after months. We have blocked and created web in many parts of the world. And also, many people do have um, access to internet. They can maybe send mails, but they cannot uh, start a business. They cannot stream. So you have also this accessibility problem still going on. Then we have the skills and literacy problem that started all the discussion and is still with us, like questions like, how to use the digital services and apps, how to detect fake news, how to deal with hate speech, how to ensure web security, how to use the right password, and also how to detect fraud. How to prevent being manipulated mm, before elections, for example. And also this called gray divide, how to not leave elderly behind. Uh, if we're talking about governmental services going digital and we don't have a um, plan B, we can easily leave those behind. And, and by the way, age is only, only one deterministic. It's always together with others, uh, like income, uh, like education. So it's often intersects. And first, talking about assess and skills, things went easier. We had um, it was easier on the hardware part, but also on the software part. Everything went plug and play, and it was easier to use the tablet. And people who never had a PC at home could um, use the tablet very easily. Even children could use computers. Then we had nicer websites. Um, people didn't have to be geeks to, to build a website. They could just use WordPress and other things. But now we have new um, new things that are coming up that's make, uh, that are making things more complex, like manipulation, fraud. We have deceptive design everywhere that makes it hard if you take something like booking a flight, it's becoming a minefield <laughs> for some people to only book what they wanted to book and, to book, and also, uh, also with the cookie banners and stuff like this, and everything is becoming AI driven. So that's why we're talking about outcomes and impacts. So questions like, what does it make with our society? How is it changing? And how do, for example, algorithmic recommender systems enforce this injustice? And the first promise of technology is to make things more efficient, but then efficient for whom? Who is profiting from, from the digitization and the automation that are connected most of the time? What about our mental health? Uh, we didn't switch to 15 hours of work like Keynes <laughs> thought we would, but um, work became more dense to uh, digitization and we have to deal with all, all these new problems we just uh, talked about. So what about the mental health problems? How do we deal with those? How about the ecological part? How about energy consumptions of um, large AI models or blockchains or streaming, constant streaming? And um, how about the, mm, the natural resources that we are exploiting from the global south and where we stand back, the waste is that we produce? And um, do we re reinforce everything? Because technology is not made 
and implement it in a vacuum, but it hits a world with already injustices that are real. So it also brings new threats with it. For example, the ubiquitous surveillance, which is basically a thing that is new. So I brought to you only two cases. Many cases are not known or not seen, but these two are well known. The Teslagen affair, where Dutch tax authorities for many years used an AI to detect fraud cases and childcare claims. And the risk profiles, they designed them themselves, and one of the deterministics for that was low income. The other one was dual citizenship. I also have dual citizenship. And only when they had the mere suspicion, they started to ask back um, the, the paid money for up to 10 years. This is a true case. Tens of thousands of families were driven to poverty. This is a picture of the parents you can see here. And some victims committed suicide. And thousands of children were placed in foster care. So these are real, real consequences. Another one not too far away, in the first COVID summer where there was a lockdown in UK, the A grade exams were canceled. And they needed A grades, so they thought um, for fairer results, they would use an AI to come up with the A grades. This is what they did, and what happened was 40% of the predicted grades were downgraded by the AI, and only 2% of the grades were upgraded because good students from schools in disadvantaged areas of the cities were downgraded, was where the few students from the more healthy areas were raised. So this also had real consequences because um, they all, many students already had places at universities based on predictions of their grades and they lost all these study places. And fortunately, the students got to know this. They went to the streets, they protested, and they won. So the A grades were canceled, and they got new um, grades by their real teachers. So what you see here is a map from the 1930s, where you see city parts being red for hazardous places, and wealthier places being more green and blue. This is exactly what happened in the um, UK case. These maps were commissioned in the 30s, and they were crucial for decisions around housing, around how much money a part of the city would get. Um, so they were really important. This kind of redlining, it's the name of it, was banned 50 years ago. But redlining is back. This man was wrongfully accused by an algorithm to be a criminal, but he isn't. But it's not only about the looks and the color of the skin. We have new kind of data that is um, available. And we're going into this later. But, and, and this kind of data is available. It's, and it's, it's taken, it's getting analyzed, and people draw conclusions. And whether it's scientific or not, they do draw conclusions out of it about people's preferences, sexual orientation, character, thoughts, moods, plans, everything that you can imagine, and also criminal behavior. We have this in there are softwares that people use to, um, to track their home office productivity. And already now, um, they are analyzing postures, speed of scrolling, use of capitals and other words, sounds, the sound of the voice, not what you're saying, but how you're saying it, the sound of your voice, and the keystroke dynamics. And this is only a few research papers that I'm, I'm showing you where people draw conclusions from, about extroversion and introversion by analyzing likes or emotional states by um, analyzing keyboard strokes sexual orientation only based on pictures of you, and also criminal predisposition only by facial recognition. This guy is Cesare Lombroso. He was a criminologist, 
and he came up with the psychological school of biological determinism. And he believed that it was possible to recognize from your face, shape, whether you are a criminal and what crime you are going to, to go for. So this is a picture from his book, uh, L'Uomo Delinquente, where you can see all the faces and whether someone would rather be a murderer or a robber. This kind of school of psychology is discredited since 1890s. Okay, it had a small renaissance in the Nazi period, but then again it was gone. Phrenology is back. So the constant monitoring and categorizing of people in our different functions as customers, as workers, as students, as citizens, is happening uh, for more efficient management, for governance, for control. And we also have automated face, uh, law enforcement, for example, in China. If you don't pay taxes, you're supposed to not be allowed to fly. And the government has a cooperation with a um, payment provider, in that case Alipay, who doesn't let you book the flight. So it's a direct enforcement of law. We have this not only in the government area, we have this in private space where DRMs or upload filter are enforcing the copyright laws. So the limitless surveillance and orchestration of citizens violates the right to privacy, the right to dignity, and this is affecting also um, the exercising of other laws. If I'm surveilled all the time, I might think about exercising my freedom to protest or freedom of speech. So everything is related. And, and the core of dignity is that we don't become an object but stay a subject in the whole development. So we had left biological determinism behind us. We had left behind us redlining. We created, not we, but other people <laughs> created for us uh, workers' rights to avoid dehumanizing work. We established the right to privacy. The right to dignity is one of our most precious rights. I guess this is um, one of the things uh, we mean when we talk about Western values, <laughs> right? So and now I call it a big step back because we are facing a rollback of social and historical innovations by things that we call technological innovations. And I'm leaving you with that last picture because I'm asking you if it's about we losing all of our rights or if we are talking more of a divide. This, um, this house at the top is the one from Mark Zuckerberg, the person who was saying that privacy is something of a past. And he bought these four houses around his house to have more privacy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ramak. Um, so I'll be building on quite a bit of what was discussed today and going through examples from quite a few years of my own empirical research in China. Um, I'm interested in how tech companies and governments come together to use tech for governance. Uh, and in China, I want to walk through three examples in quite a bit of depth and keep asking a question related to that. Um, and also point out some of the holes and fallacies in ideas that any of this technology is ubiquitous or works the way it should. And hopefully invite everyone here to think about kind of creative alternatives, building on what Evgeny was talking about earlier. Um, so I will talk about the social credit system, um, automation of courtrooms in China or courtroom AI, and motion recognition technology. And I want to highlight that for these, this order was intentional, right? We're going from the system that is most um, like deeply rooted in Chinese law to the one that is least rooted in law and kind of most freewheeling. And we're also going from an example that I find the least threatening to the most threatening. Um, and I, we can kind of get into what that means. So with the social credit system, I spent quite a bit of time in China doing interviews um, with people in tech companies and the government to understand what is this system that I'm sure most people in this room have heard of? 
and how are tech companies potentially complicit in making it operate. So you've probably heard that the social credit system is a scoring system that is used to um, evaluate people's behavior and morality in China. And that's not quite what it really is. Um, for many years, there were developments in Chinese law to try to get people to comply with court orders. So as Ramak was talking about, there were people who, let's say, didn't pay their taxes or in other ways violated administrative laws that were already on the books in China. And they could evade punishment. The punishment often involved a fine. Um, they would be sued in a court of law. People just wouldn't show up and could get away with it. Um, as of 2014, there was this kind of push to digitize a lot of parts of bureaucracy in the courts to make that really hard for people to do. So again, new laws were not invented. There was sort of a doubling down on pre-existing laws and a tightening of information sharing between bureaucracies. So what that meant was you maybe don't pay your taxes, you are sued by the courts as always, um, they issue a decision, say that you have to pay a fine and back taxes, and instead of it ending there, that information now gets shared with four dozen government departments so that you can't ride a high-speed rail, you can't send your children to private school. All of these things that are seen as luxury consumption, um, things that somebody who presumably has the money to pay their taxes but chose not to, should not be allowed to do until they pay their taxes. Um, one of the things that made it into the news more is that that data also got shared with tech companies. Um, specifically data from the blacklists of people who violated the law and were not um, quick to address their, their violation. Um, when tech companies take this data in, it makes it harder to pay, again, for plane tickets, for certain items. I've been interested also in how tech companies become complicit in shaming some of these people. So some of my research showed that um, the Chinese version of TikTok called Douyin between ads in certain cities would display these people's faces and information about how much money they owed or what um, violation of administrative law they committed. And the hope was that it was done within their neighborhood so that their neighbors would see and pressure them to get themselves off of blacklists. Um, I looked at examples of how tech companies were using an initial partnership like that to then spin off new products because they had access to government data they wouldn't have had access to otherwise. Um, which is something I think a lot of people miss when talking about China, that it's not that the government has access to all public and private sector data, and it's not that private companies are already so intertwined with the government that they could easily access government data. There's a kind of ongoing dance and communication between the two. Um, Sam Sachs, who's a really great scholar on this topic, has called it like a push and a pull. Um, that means that some companies will have certain access to government data and some government agencies will have partnerships with uh, tech companies to access their data. So going back, there are scoring systems. There are cities that will develop a score you can get if you're just a resident of that city. And in my interviews, city government officials would tell me, we can't use data from Alibaba. We can't use data from Tencent or any of these other big companies because we can't validate it. So we're only going to use public sector data that the government has already collected on people. Then they told me, we also can't give them exciting rewards that tech companies can give them. We don't have the kind of money to subsidize that at scale. So the kinds of rewards you might get are being able to take out a library book without putting down a deposit, um, because at a lot of libraries in China, you do have to put down a deposit in case you lose the book. Or be having um, expedited processes when you apply for administrative licenses. So um, the equivalent example I think of in the US is like when you go to get your driver's license, maybe you get in a faster queue. Um, it's not surprising that these are not particularly enticing perks. So even in places where there are scoring systems, something like 4% of citizens are actually taking advantage of them and the vast majority of people ignore them. Um, and that is my kind of like quick condensed overview of social credit. We can get into it more. Um, but for all of these examples, I kind of want to walk through, right? With something like this, the government gets legitimacy by showing people, hey, in the past, people used to be able to violate administrative law and get away with it. But look, now we're doing something. Um, it surprised me when talking to Chinese friends that that was as much as they thought of this. They barely gave it another thought. They didn't see this as a infringement on their rights. They didn't really think very much about people who might be caught in this system due to a bureaucratic error or who struggled to get out of it. Um, because this doesn't really, it's not very visible or like an everyday part of most people's lives. Um, 
what so what the government gets out of it is you know this appearance of legitimacy access to like more systematic data of in categories that it already was collecting data on and some partnerships with tech companies what tech companies get out of it is this kind of appearance that they are doing a social service for the government um, and also in some cases access to government data that they wouldn't have otherwise had um, so moving on to the next example that I kind of came across while doing the social credit research because it is so tied into the courts. Um, so within China, there's this massive project. They'll call it the Smart Courts Project in some documents. And the goal is to digitize the courts. Um, so this is part of like broader judicial reform. There's hundreds of Chinese judges who have been pulled from the courts because the processes through which they became, like they were admitted to the bar, have changed, the standards are higher. Even though many of them have decades of experience, they were pulled from their jobs. But the caseload stayed the same, if not got higher. Um, and it happened to, at, that the courts wanted to bring technology in to manage that problem. So there are so many different examples of what kind of counts as courtroom AI in China. From the court side, it's everything from speech to text recording pens that will create an automated transcript of a court hearing that becomes the official document. Um, there are systems that will assess the case linguistically, like semantically, and look for how cases that were similar were decided in the past, so that when the judge hands down the decision, they can compare it to past decisions. That also gets used to evaluate the judges themselves, which has made some judges a little bit wary and uncomfortable of this system that is also watching them, especially after many of their colleagues were pulled from their jobs. Um, on the potential litigant side, there are systems where, let's say you want to bring a case to be heard. Well, it's expensive, it takes a lot of time. You can plug your details into a software Alibaba has, and it'll tell you the probability that you'll win the case. So this can act as a deterrent for many people to not pursue a case at all, really based on this one system's evaluation that is just an estimation. Um, there are all kinds of issues that arise with this. So going back to where the state incentives are, where the firm incentives are. The state incentives, right, came up a few times today, social reproduction. Like how do we standardize our court system? Well, if you automate assessments of how a case should be decided and you're kind of gently nudging a judge towards making a particular decision, over time you'll end up with precedent. Um, also, prestige. There's a lot of writing in China and increasingly outside of China about how, for example, they have the biggest open source database of court judgments in the world. So this has been publicly made available online. Um, companies and students can use it for research and developing applications. The hope is that you know you'll have um, like hackathons and other things that like the next big legal tech development will come out of. At the same time, it's not a complete data set. So there's been reporting on how death penalty cases mysteriously disappeared overnight from the database. Um, you know there are researchers like Rory Truex at Princeton who are looking at if you can determine um, like discrimination, racial discrimination in sentencing by looking at cases where the potential, where the litigants were of a particular ethnicity within China. Um, so the cases will go off the system and they're often related to some of these like more difficult questions that the Chinese government might find like too intrusive or too critical. Um, on the firm side, again, being the company that was able to develop the speech to text um, recognition or any part of this system, you might potentially have lock-in, right? You get bigger market share because you worked closely with judges and software engineers and all of the people that had to come together to build this system and then you get to sell it to courts across the country. Um, so it, um, I, wa I also wanted to raise this topic of fairness because I know it was in the title of this talk and it's very relevant here. While doing research on the smart court system with a colleague of mine in China, something that we found kind of surprising was the conception of fairness here had a lot to do with convenience. Um, so saving people time. There's a social, tech for social good narrative built into the smart courts and how they're promoted in China that sort of bring up like, think of all the people who live 
so far away from the courts, who never had access to justice, well, now they don't have to take two trains and pay for a hotel, right? They can do a hearing entirely online. They're trying to codify some of this into law, so there's a proposal to um, amend the Constitution so that cases, or to amend the Civil Code so that cases um, heard online carry the exact same weight as cases heard in person, and this is huge. I don't think there's anywhere else in the world that has done this yet. Um, so, finally, yeah, the, there's, the fairness element is sort of like about access and um, convenience, the, the idea that people spend tons of time, waste tons of time on bureaucratic processes that suddenly will be sped up, right? The example I gave of even just seeing the potential that you'll win and maybe deciding not to hear the case makes the caseload lighter for certain judges and courts. Um, so I then want to um, kind of point out how there are a lot of questions not being answered and, and like issues that get distracted from when you make that argument for smart courts um, and how this is probably going to become a problem in a lot of other places that are trying to implement this. Like earlier this year, I and a few others gave comments on um, India's draft to bring AI into their court system. And again, you wonder if these systems are going to leave people who are already vulnerable even more vulnerable. Like I've asked questions, you know, if you're doing a, a court hearing on Zoom and it's a couple with like a domestic dispute and they share the same living space, like, yeah, it sounds convenient that they're doing this on Zoom, they can do it from anywhere, but should they be doing this from the same home? Um, in places where people pay for data or are data strapped, like is this really the best solution for them? A lot of these questions are not being answered right now, but I think this is going to become like more of a global issue and that's kind of why it's the one that I'm like a little bit more afraid of than social credit. Um, so finally, I want to end with emotion recognition. Um, I, this is something that I worry is going to become potentially as ubiquitous as face recognition if there isn't more of a critical discussion about it now. So since the 1960s, there have been psychology researchers who tried to argue that human emotions are discrete and measurable phenomena. So your facial movements, um, tone of voice, body gestures, they argue that these all convey uh, internally felt emotions externally and that they're a one-to-one -one match. Um, and in the decades since, there have been many tech companies and researchers who tried to build on the shaky scientific principles of emotion recognition um, for commercial applications. So my research um, in looking at how Chinese academics develop these methods and then how tech companies take them up, how governments legitimize those uses, we looked at cameras in schools that claim to be able to detect if students are paying attention and make assessments about their performance and their discipline, um, sharing those reports with their parents and their teachers. We looked at how this technology is used in cars. Um, the claim was that this is a safety mechanism that can detect when drivers are fatigued, but of course what we saw was that it was a way for insurance companies to potentially not pay out claims and accidents because they could see that the driver was angry in a particular moment before a crash. Um, and finally, we looked at how public security was using this technology. So some of it is deployed in airports, subways. Um, there are police stations that are being trained in how to use this in interrogations. And the claim is that there are moments where um, someone's face will kind of reveal a clue related to the investigation. There were companies using marketing language like human rights law has gotten stronger in China, so a way to get around it is to use emotion recognition technology to find the moments when the person kind of leaks the truth, right, because the, the idea is that the person you're interrogating is essentially deceptive no matter what. Um, we uh, kind of traced the process of how the research ignores decades of work that has debunked the idea that we have seven basic emotions or however many. There's other research that will quantify it different ways. Um, we looked at how it's kind of related to like race science and physiognomy like Ramak brought up. Um, but a lot of that didn't really get discussed in China and or is outright ignored in this push to build applications. We also saw how companies played on people's fears. So for the school example, they would bring up how, um, you know, there were kindergarten students who were abused by teachers, but if you had an emotion recognition system in the classroom, you might be able to prevent something like that from happening. Um, the same goes for drivers. You know, there were cases where, um, female passengers um, were sexually assaulted and murdered uh, 
were using like the biggest ride sharing company in China, Didi Chuxing, and so there were claims that you could prevent that from happening by having driver monitoring. You know, a spoiler across all of the areas we looked at is that every, almost every case had a form of workplace surveillance baked into it, right? If you're surveilling students, you're also surveilling teachers, and so that's a way of like measuring their performance, this claim that two teachers who have the exact same students, right? One set of students maybe is happier with one teacher, that makes them a better teacher. Um, and again, there just wasn't very much of an effort to talk about all of the holes and inaccuracies in such systems. Um, you had local governments putting out calls for developing the technology for um, driver monitoring, so they were willing to fund it themselves. There were conferences that would bring together law enforcement, academic researchers, and tech companies to build labs around how to train police in using this. Um, and again, there's a similar dynamic across all of these, right, where the firms, there's no incentive for them to address some of the inaccuracies. And as they, the market for face recognition becomes saturated, they're trying to say, hey, this is a step change. We're going to be able to make evaluations of people's emotions. You can predict the actions they're going to take and prevent them. One of the companies we looked at claimed they could prevent prisoner riots by surveilling prisoners and seeing how their facial expressions changed. Um, so I want to conclude by just saying that with all three of these systems, it's really easy to fall into the idea that there's an inevitable, an inevitable conclusion that will just hit a peak moment where everybody is using this technology. And sometimes you'll see in the media that, you know, tech companies in the US or wherever else say to keep up with, to compete with China, to prevent them from doing it worse, we also need to be developing these same applications. Um, I think that's patently false. And I was really excited to be invited to speak at the Biennale because I think that artists and creatives and designers are some of the people to generate the alternatives, many of which are not technological. Um, you know, when I think about courtroom AI, I wonder why we're not asking, how do we change what a courtroom is, or what a courtroom can be in suiting citizens' needs or in looking at some of the biggest problems with the legal system itself, right? Like, why does it have to be this patchwork set of solutions that are really easy for tech companies to make and that we're going to just keep having the same debates over how it's biased, how it's discriminatory? Um, with emotion recognition, I think back to how actually my first encounter with this idea was from a more speculative design project that my colleague Nora Howell did in graduate school where um, she developed this shirt that had fabric that changed color. It was hooked up to an ear EEG reader and she had people um, have conversations with prompts that would make them feel strongly, you know, about their childhoods or about their relationships, and they were meant to reason with each other conversationally about why the shirts were changing color. There was never a moment that it said, you're angry, you're sad, you were in charge, you were the one asking and reflecting upon how you felt. Um, none of the applications of emotion recognition I saw in the Chinese like research were like that. They weren't more speculative or reflective, but that doesn't mean there isn't room for products like that in our lives. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to encourage kind of conversation for alternatives that work around the state firm dynamics I was describing or outside of it altogether. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Shazid. Uh, I would like, uh, so now we continue and we'll speak with uh, April after, because I see April online already. I just say hello, April, welcome. And uh, yeah, I mean, this both um, uh, presentation are really extraordinary because uh, they really merge uh, some different fields of uh, research from human sciences so that we get a little bit away from the technology borders, you know, like such as phrenology and psychology, basically. And uh, I found very interesting this, uh, maybe it's a question for you both, that isn't that paradox, isn't that paradoxical that in a, society, in a neoliberal society where we hear every day constantly that we have to be empowered, you have to be, you know, uh, responsible and uh, to become, <laughs> Uh, more and more uh, a regular consumer. On the other hand, these, we are like really like witnessing uh, the, the construction of uh, um, a sort of uh, of the loss of our psychology, of the loss of our capacity to be um, emotionally uh, alive, to be. Uh, I mean, the red line is back again, 
And even in, in, a, in, a, in a techno-liberal society, uh, uh, do, do you see what they, uh, do you see it as a paradox, this contrast between the society that is constantly trying to enhance the, the subject through very sort of, uh, again, uh, selfish uh, aspect, and on the other hand, is completely alienating it, you know? It's completely like, um, uh, it's producing all the tools that will make that However, you, I mean, will, you'll be condemned or, or, you know, you won't even know why because you won't be able to, uh, and because emotion is not quantifiable, uh, because uh, this is a question for, for both of you, Amak. Um, I think we are producing all the time data. And I even wonder if we should call, if we need another term for information that is so deeply invasive about us, should we still call it data or shouldn't we use another term for, for those data that, is, that has nothing to do with persons, but this is a side, a thought of mine. Because it's, uh, we are not a material, but everything we do is produ producing data points and everything is getting commercialized. This is also what Afghani said. So everything that is available is having mm, looked at from a commercializing way. So, and it is possible. Basically, we, we talked a lot about big tech. We, did, we never talk about Axiom and other companies who are building profiles, who are dealing, this is the, the core of their business model is to, um, to, to sell our data with, I mean, profiles from us. And it's not really us, it's like a distortion version of us. And Harris calls it a voodoo doll of us. But this is then the digital reality, and this is then real, and we don't even see why we don't get a job. Maybe it was based on our profile that was distorted. So yes, everything we do is providing information for somebody who makes money out of it. And if we don't, if we don't, do not detangle this, um, this will stay a problem. So for you, this merge um, uh, between uh, political power and, and, and capitalism, basically this collusion that do exist, I mean, do exist also in this uh, control and surveillance that with predictive, uh, predictable uh, algorithm is anticipating the so-called crimes? Yes, also, and we have um, power asymmetries on different levels. It's um, government and citizens, employees, employers, schools and universities and so on with their students. And we have, that's why we had division of powers in the democracy. That's why it was so important to have these divisions because we know that too much power concentration is hard to handle. Now we have, um, through technology, we have a rise of the power asymmetries and we have powers that are connected, like private um, public partnerships. So governments are totally dependent of technology, big tech. So they are working together and vice versa. They are working together. In, in, Japan, in China, it's more obvious they live it, but also in the Western world, we have it too. And, and so you have a bad development that is um, against all of the rules that we set up for a good democracy, that we need this power device and so on. And, and even the automatic enforcement of laws is going only to one direction, right? So um, the enforcement of copyright is one, one example, but also the enforcement of um, punishment from the government, but we never enforce automatically the rights of uh, consumers against, uh, um, against Amazon or so. They have to go and claim and find out and do the whole long way. So this part of the rights, the rights that we have against governments or against um, big commercial um, companies is never uh, automated because there is no motivation behind of those who make it. And this is also something that gives a more uh, new dynamic to it. In which, in which sense? What kind of new dynamics? And that um, the enforcement is taking part only one-sided, again, uh, towards the um, citizen and the consumer, but never in that other direction. We have legal tech 
coming up bits for, for example, your rights to um, when, when your flight was cancelled. But this is only the beginning and still you have to pay, you have to, to, to find a ways. And we will have more and more automated courtrooms and law enforcement towards the citizens. But who is enforcing automatically our uh, freedom of speech and our other rights? So this is more complicated and you have to go and fight for your own right. And this part is not automated. Interesting. Sajeda, regarding this question. Don't you think that there's a kind of, I mean, regarding, I mean, thinking from the angle of China, maybe you have another um, opinion on it. Um, well, I had a few thoughts while you were both talking. One is, you know, now that I'm back in the U.S. full time, I've been really frustrated to see how this political debate from the 1990s has resurfaced. So back then there was kind of talk of like open and free societies versus closed ones. And now what you're seeing is it's transmuted onto the idea of like, digital authoritarians or digital autocracies. And it, they very rarely articulate what the opposite is, but it's supposedly kind of assumed to be like Europe and the United States in whatever state they are currently in, which as we've heard throughout today is a pretty sad one, right? Um, but it's sort of like, it, it's based kind of on what Ramak is saying. Like I think there has been this like veneer of democracy and a defense of what tech governance looks like in the West that doesn't actually take into account what it really is. Um, one of the problems I have with that is that it's still, it's like trying to claim that it's a democracy and a deliberative process that all people are allowed to be part of, but it's still valuing technocracy and giving a few particular elites, really mostly people who founded some of the major tech companies we all use, the stage in setting the agenda. <laughs> um, I, like that has been kind of a problem I see recurring in my work, especially when I look at this idea that the US and China are in like a new art arms race or AI cold war. Like a lot of that is kind of, it starts from this place of like an almost patriotic fervor around the United States and like maintaining the status quo. <laughs> um, and all of, a lot of that feeds into, again, the thing I brought up about inevitability, right? Like even those of us railing against some of these technologies are kind of coming from a place of treating them like it's inevitable that they're going to exist forever in our lifetimes. And we don't really know that. Like some of the most inspiring work I've seen is more um, creative, like, you know, Branch Magazine had these really great articles kind of looking at issues around like climate and tech. There's all kinds of like fairly low tech alternatives to many of the systems we talked about today. I know that they're kind of critique people will make is like, that's not scalable, that can't work for everyone. But people tried it. People tried it on like pretty low budgets. Um, you know, that I think has given me a little bit of hope to push back against this idea of inevitability. And it sucks, like even at the beginning of the talk, I said I think emotion recognition could potentially come to occupy a similar place in our lives as face recognition. Um, you know, my, my colleague Vidushi and Marta and I, when we were doing our work, we looked at the first publicly widely reported on use of face recognition was at the Super Bowl in Tampa in 2001, and now it's 2022, and we're having fights about how to ban or place moratoria on these technologies. Like when we wrote our paper, we had that example in the back of our minds asking, how do we not get there when it comes to emotion recognition? Like how do we start from a place of saying, this doesn't have to be an inevitable outcome. What do people need to hear? What do people need to do so that this doesn't happen again? I was listening to you and uh, particularly about your experience between both the United States and, and China and, and I was wondering how, uh, what uh, basically the ideology of the Silicon Valley is advocating has, the, it's also a question for you, Hamak, because you spoke about decentralization. Has decentralization in terms of cryptocurrencies, in terms of uh, uh, what could decentralization of economy could provide uh, uh, more than the state, how this ideology works in China? where the state is, is a very centralized state, but even though you said before that it also worked very provincially at some point, right? I mean, I think that kind of decentralization is already built in. Like something I noticed in doing my interviews on social credit is that almost no one I talked to in academia or government or law thought that there was going to be like one national scoring system for the whole country because they accepted that different cities, different provinces, they have different levels of development, they have different needs, like they were hyper aware of context and very much okay with there being differential like policies across them. Um, it's called like in the, in the literature on China, it's called experimentation under hierarchy. There's just this understanding that you're going to try a bunch of different things in a bunch of different places. 
Um, and it's, they don't really call it decentralization, but I, I can see how from the outside we might think that. Um, that's something I feel like I've been seeing a lot is outside of the US and Europe, the, there are terms that we use, you know, we have a fixed idea of what decentralization means, but it means something completely different in a different place. Um, uh, there's a great project that um, felt relevant also to some of what was discussed earlier today. It's called AI, A New Lexicon. Um, and it was a kind of, in the spirit of Raymond Williams's book, Keywords, like different people contributed short essays about how one particular term around AI or technology gets used in like different countries around the world. I highly recommend people check it out because I think one of the issues we're coming up against is that we're not all speaking the same language even when we're using the same words. Um, so even though I would say like this phenomenon I just described in China can be read as a certain type of decentralization, it's still one that serves the purpose of propping up the government and the current political system, right? It's not one that's in any way divesting power and in Silicon Valley as well. It's like if these companies are still reliant on venture capital <laughs> and their same structures of how they produce the same things over and over again, I don't think they're really decentralizing or distributing power. Yeah, exactly, I, I agree. And um, you, Hamak, you also mentioned to finish with the impact on, on uh, mental health of all this. Uh, uh, I really li like the way you actually brought up by saying that technology, I mean, is a pharmacon at some point, you know, it's like the remedy and the poison. And um, I was wondering how do you, uh, uh, particularly in, 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 that, uh, in that very uh, complex time we are living in today, uh, how much you, how, how, how do you think that if we stay a little bit positive with technology, it can be uh, anyway a tool to improve mental health? Difficult, huh? um, <laughs> Yeah. For me, technology is only a tool. It's not the remedy and it's not the harm. We, are, we have so many tools, one of the most important being our creativity. And uh, we, we need to push it back to what it is to be a tool. And then a mental health problem, I would say that's not technology that would um, solve the problem. We, we need um, decisions on what we don't want to make, on how we want to limit uh, the workload on people, and how to, I mean, mental health comes uh, out of pressure um, most of the time. I'm from Iran. <laughs> uh, when I go there, there's a lot of pressure on people, and it changes them. And, and it leads to mental health problems, depressions, and so on. So the way out is to put back pressure from people. And one of them is um, by not being surveilled all the time, at least those who are aware of being surveilled and they don't do care, this is something that um, increases um, mental health problems. Then work is always a topic, and we never started the real discussions around profit distribution of automation profit distribution. This is leading to segregation, so the, to the gap. We all know this statistic of productivity and wages. It's, and since the 70s, the gap is getting bigger and bigger. Technology would give a chance to roll that back and to make this gap smaller. We don't use it that way. So it's basically around this decisions, what we do with this technology. It's not about the technology itself. And it's about political um, political decisions. And sometimes I wonder why we try to uh, regulate technology and not the business models behind. Why do we need a business model that um, lives out of surveilling people and selling that data? Why do we need that? Um, and, w and also the business model of the web is still advertising. It's difficult to think it differently because this is the low-hanging fruit, right? So we had all these discussions about, yeah, if you would pay for the same service without ads and so on. But why do we need more than um, personalized ads on a high level? We know that it's not that effectful. People are fed up. They're, we have also over-consuming. That's why people don't buy anymore. And, and the technology and the business models are trying to get into your head and to manipulate you. To, to give you differential pricing and to tackle you on your weakest point of the day just to make you buy something to, 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 that you don't need and that is not good for ecology too. So um, that doesn't make sense. 
So why aren't we talking about these kind of things, about um, business models that we want and that are not toxic and not always on the technology part of things? But just before we continue regarding these mental health things and regarding your field of research also, because you, you brought a very interesting point, the red line, um, we cannot, I mean, uh, avoid the, the fact that these sort of uh, predictive algorithms that are supposed to arrest all of us are also contributing to uh, the, the, the destruction of mental health, right? Yeah, of the, stress, etc. The horrible thing about redlining and things like that, just predictions of something that is not you, that has nothing to do with you, it's just where you live or what happened to your neighbors. And this projection leads to the fact that you cannot come out of your um, of, of what is expected from you. You, you you're, this is really a tragic, right? So you're not, you don't have the possibilities because someone is keeping you in that place. So, so this also leads to mental problems. Everybody knows that um, if, if you cannot do what you want, if you don't have the chances, uh, preposition and societal wise, that it leads to, um, uh, you cannot fulfill your dreams. I mean, it's always limited what you can do. But then you see that others can do something that you cannot do, and it doesn't have with something that um, it doesn't have to do with your skills or what you uh, or your motivations. And this is really frustrating. And you, if you have lots of this kind of frustrating experiences, of course, this leads to mental health problems. But I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not a medicine person. <laughs> It's anyway a good point. Uh, it reminds me the work of Rua Benjamin and Race After Technology, the way she drawn the, through the uh, concept of the Jim Crow codes, the, the, the whole turned red legacy of white supremacy in the US. Then. And uh, so maybe now we, can, uh, we will continue with April or we take some question. I see you online, April. Hi. Can we hear? Hi. So the stage is yours. Hey, thank you. I'm just going to dive right into it. Um, so I am a sociologist by training. Um, I got my PhD in sociology, but I now study tech and race and gender. So a lot of my comments are coming from the work that I'm doing right now, studying race and ethnicity and the way that algorithms shape our online dating experiences. Um, but also from the framing of algorithmic preparation, which I will explain in just a little bit. So after the resurgence of the movement for Black Lives, suddenly everyone seemed to care about race and racism in the U.S. And more importantly, their branding that positioned them as supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. Black influencers and intellectuals pointed out the glaringly obvious fact that the sudden shift appeared to be driven by the desire to capture the Black dollar rather than a focus on overall wellness and safety of Black people. Um, Still, there was momentum ushered in by a new historic moment that held the promise of generating anti-racist action across social structures. A lot of people were asking, can I be anti-racist? And that includes tech companies, uh, or they were at least pretending to be anti-racist. Uh, but anti-racist thought necessarily involves reparation. And reparation means looking at the past and the future to understand the whole story of systemic inequity. It means making a plan to repair past wrongs by making way for equity in the future. And at times this should involve financial compensation and at other times it involves harm reduction measures to protect individuals from techno-solutionism that does little to protect those who are most vulnerable. To do this, we must first hold the knowledge of systemic and widespread discrimination and disenfranchisement and an admission that meritocracy cannot exist in a world where disparity is the norm. It involves those in power admitting that they are part of a system that upholds racial inequity and that they benefit in various degrees from racial or ethnic privilege, even if they themselves are not actively espousing white supremacist thought. Anti-racist action entails using the knowledge to disseminate or dismantle existing systems of racial oppression and proactively taking steps to prohibit and inhibit the growth and or rebuilding of new adaptable racial systems of oppression or class-based systems of oppression. Taken the wisdom of community organizers around best practices and movement building, 
and adding depth to anti-racist action on an individual or corporate level, one should name, claim, name and claim their personal or organizational responsibility, plan to address or repair past wrongs, and communicate the ways that they can be held accountable by communities that have been harmed by injustice or inequity on an ongoing and regular basis. So to get at this framing, I use Black feminism as a tool to think about reparation and what that might look like in the context of tech companies. And I do that because it offers the hope of intervention for everyone. Where technology is concerned, it offers insights for programmers and developers and other relevant stakeholders. Um, that's because Black feminism's main purpose is to resist oppression. One of the core tenets of Black feminism and other Black liberation ideologies is that these concepts actively work to dismantle inequity for all people groups, not just Black feminists. No one is free until we are all free. Hence, my intervention works to highlight the combining social processes of marginalization and to position alternative frameworks that may help usher in freedom bit by bit. Black feminist thought encapsulates a body of critical social thought produced by Black women in response to historical oppression in the U.S. and in colonized and formerly colonized locations around the globe. Black feminist thought first emerged because of existing systems of knowledge, and namely mainstream feminism and critical Marxist thought, uh, did not adequately address the unique oppressions experienced by women of color. My personal approach to Black feminism leans heavily on the principles outlined by Patricia Hill Collins and Black feminist thought, and it works to address the exploitation of all oppressed people groups. And the thing is, many Black feminist scholars that a lot of us know uh, have already given us vision for algorithmic reparation, though they don't call it that. Uh, technology enthusiasts report that digitizing or automating older social mechanisms and rituals can sort of get rid of social ails such as racism or classism. But scholars have already pointed out numerous examples for which this idealist thinking fails to hold true. More to the point, they demonstrate that algorithm-driven technologies and platforms that are part of our everyday lives can and do rely on pre-existing biases, often racial biases. Further, white programmers and developers build these pre-existing biases into algorithms that control systems that impact our lives. According to Sophia Noble, the acclaimed author of Algorithms of Oppression, artificial intelligence will become a major human rights issue in the 21st century. We are only beginning to understand the long-term consequences of these decision-making tools in both masking and deepening social inequality. Part of the challenge of understanding algorithmic oppression is to understand that mathematical formulations to drive automated decisions are made by human beings. While we often think of terms such as big data and algorithms as being benign, neutral, or objective, they are anything but. The people who make these decisions hold all types of values, many of which openly promote racism, sexism, and false notions of meritocracy, which is well documented in studies of Silicon Valley and other tech corridors. Algorithms play an integral role in so many aspects of our lives. From voting to healthcare to incarceration, like my fellow panelists have already discussed, and enhanced policing mechanisms here in the US in particular, algorithms are increasingly incorporated into existing mechanisms of control in society. Their covert nature and ease with which they run in the background of our social media platforms can obscure the fact that they maintain, uphold, and support systematic inequity and bolster white supremacy. The fact that companies who employ these technologies do so with relative impunity and without transparency is cause for concern. At the very least, we should question whether or not we as consumers and platform users have the right to regulate how and when algorithms are used and the technologies we use. Although many proponents of algorithm-driven technologies argue that they eliminate human bias, critical perspectives argue that algorithms reinstate and camouflage bias with shiny new technologies. Ruha Benjamin, First, this obfuscation of algorithmic inequity as the new Jim Code, which is innovation that enables social containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era. That entails a crucial socio-technical component that hides not only the nature of domination, but allows it to penetrate every facet of social life. As critical race theory questions the relationships between race, power, and concepts such as liberal order, Critical algorithm studies and critical internet studies examine the mechanisms of implicit normative whiteness in every layer of algorithm-driven technologies and in internet culture. 
and Benjamin's conceptualization, discriminatory design refers to a theoretical perspective that positions the coding process in which social biases are built into technological systems, including the laws and policies that govern their usage. Algorithm-driven technologies contribute to structural inequality that is made up of many interconnected algorithm-based systems in which individuals are reduced to numbers and data points without regard for their humanity. If that sounds somewhat circular, that's because the process is cyclical. As Kathy O'Neill writes, employers, for example, are increasingly using credit scores to evaluate potential hires. Those who pay their bills promptly, the thinking goes, are more likely to show up to work on time and follow the rules. In fact, there are plenty of responsible people and good workers who suffer misfortune and see their credit scores fall. These scores, which are algorithmically calculated. In short, a credit score is an algorithmically driven assessment of projected performance, but the social belief that low credit scores equate to poor job performance leaves many qualified applicants for being passed over for jobs. The underlying assumption that this drive is rooted in classical white American neoliberal, neoliberal bootstrap mythology suggests individuals should be able to work, save, and earn their way to good credit. This myth of meritocracy ignores the fact that good credit is afforded to those who do not rely on credit cards or those who do not face moments of leaving bills unpaid because they have a type of financial security that intergenerational wealth guarantees. In other words, a safety net. Centuries of legal and political disenfranchisement have all but guaranteed that people of color are systematically excluded from wealth building tools like home ownership and investing meaning that white credit seekers have been able to accrue credit worthiness through the passing of intergenerational wealth and stability. As a result of going without a job, individuals turn to emergency options, which often include predatory and exploitive lending, further lowering credit scores. In this way, algorithms and the employers who rely on them reproduce structural inequity, rewarding white individuals for their white privilege and class privilege. When data about people is a mass, decisions can be easily divorced from the people that these decisions impact. I argue that algorithmically driven technologies encourage the same type of social distance that leaves us unaware of the social consequences they engender. When we treat others as datafied commodities based on limited bits of information we receive from a few um, credit scores or other algorithmically derived evaluations, we are forced to make quick decisions based on social cues that we are presented with and that can play a role in our decision making. If we are ever to realize the so-called equitizing nature of the internet and of algorithmic technologies, we need to interrogate the implicit biases inherent to them and interrogate the algorithms that drive them. Namely, we must recognize that the internet is a space in which whiteness is the default. All other racial categories are positioned in opposition to whiteness, and that means that internet culture and algorithmic culture were created by and for white people who have an interest in maintaining the status quo of power relations. The field of fair machine learning has emerged in response to these issues, developing mathematical techniques that increase fairness, so-called fairness, based on anti-classification, classification parity, and calibration standards. In practice, these computational correctives invariably fall short operating from an algorithmic idealism that does not and cannot address systemic intersectional stratifications. Taking present fair machine learning methods as a point of departure, myself and colleagues Jenny Davis and Michael Yang suggest that the notion instead should be about the practice of algorithmic reparation. This theory rooted is, is rooted in theories of intersectionality and we suggest that reparative algorithms name, unmask, and undo allocative and representational harms as they materialize in socio-technical form. We propose algorithmic reparation as a foundation for building, evaluating, adjusting, and when necessary, omitting and eradicating machine learning systems that cannot be fair. Our call for reparative algorithms is motivated by a broader mandate for equity and social justice, but it is also motivated by specific conditions of automation that leave no neutral options. In general, the distribution of resources can either reinforce inequality, make them worse, or make them better. However, machine learning systems are intrinsically self-perpetuating in ways that ossify and intensify the outcomes they engender. This is because algorithms render decisions seemingly objective and divorced from human discretion. Because they are opaque and inscrutable, and because their outcomes often have no technical means of undoing, 
even as circumstances call for correction. Our proposal for algorithmic reparation assumes a moral duty to ameliorate rather than aggravate structural and historical stratifications as they manifest in computational code. This proposal sits in direct opposition with the prevailing logic of fair machine learning, which seeks to de-bias algorithms and make them fairer. In contrast, a reparative approach assumes and leverages bias to make algorithms more equitable and just. In practice, the problems of algorithmic systems are the problems of social systems, and meaningful solutions will be technical and social in nature. These solutions will not come easy, nor fast, nor with absolute finitude. Just as undoing racism, sexism, classism, and colonialism are continuous, evolving, nonlinear projects, so too is the journey to unmake the inequalities of algorithms and code. Algorithm reparation is not a final or encompassing answer, but a critical, equitable, and intersectional foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are still have 10 minutes. Maybe we should hop into the question in the audience. Don't be shy. Maybe you, Hamak, you have some question to ask to April. Or you, Shajeda? Um, yeah, well, April, that was really great. And I was wondering if you're already seeing examples of things that you would consider algorithmic reparations or on the path to it happening that you could tell us about? Yeah, absolutely. So um, a shameless plug, we are actually hosting a workshop on algorithmic reparation here in the US at the end of the month where we will be putting together some test cases and some feasibility use cases. Um, so we're really excited to see what um, other people in the tech space think about this approach and um, if they think that is something that they can adopt within their framework. Um, but we do have some cases where uh, some researchers at FACT, um, and I can't ever remember what FACT stands for, but um, a conference, uh, an international conference on computing and tech um, actually did test this uh, with regard to race and were able to see if this would be usable. Um, and they found that for their context that it actually was. Um, so we are sort of thinking about it more from a theoretical framework and hoping that we can teach technologists and people in the tech sector about how to implement this within the work that they're doing. So we're very much still in the developing phases, but I think even as a theoretical framing, it does a lot for moving us from thinking about fairness as something that can be achievable um, to thinking about fairness as something that is obsolete and instead trying to make sure that we reduce harm and build new systems that are mindful of systemic inequality. So much. Um, in fact, is the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in Machine Learning Conference. In fact, as you were talking about it, I was like, oh, I would love to see this as like a fact tutorial because a lot of tech companies come to that conference. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely look out for that. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to ask you, uh, April, a question that would actually uh, lead to another conference we will have later and maybe the work that Hamak you, you've done and um, Catherine Baker on Kleros. How much uh, you have heard um, in the US, I think a couple of years ago, there was a software that was used by the, by the Ministry of Justice, Justice, sorry, Justice called Compass, which has raised, I mean, a lot of scandals, etc. And how is the situation right now in the US? I think Compass has been banned, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure that it has been banned holistically. I know that it's been banned in certain locations. So um, there's definitely a pushback against Compass and that's actually one of the main examples that we use in the paper when we suggest failed approaches to fairness. Um, Compass is the number one example that we sort of rely on when we say 
they had tried to achieve fairness through existing fair machine learning approaches, but these actually failed and did not work um, and actually just made their biases worse. Um, so yeah, we certainly are not advocating for a compass and it's sort of a really good use case for looking at um, how these systems fail and how fairness is really an obsolete way of thinking about approaches to equitizing machine learning. But actually, if I remember the, the essay of Roa Benjamin and from some fr American friends, I heard that even back before those technology of surveillance and predictive technology, even the zip code in the US was a tool to discriminate populations. Do you think also that there is a sort of uh, handless uh, sort of uh, continuity that is happening nowadays and obviously because of the power of technology has been is enhanced by that, you know, a technology of segregation? Apologies, there's a delay. Um, yeah, I definitely think that the technology of segregation is enhanced by automated technologies, um, especially because they make it seem as though it's very seamless. That's the danger of algorithmic technologies is that they really make things seem like this is just part of the system. This is just part of the social system. And um, any bias that we're seeing as an outcome is simply there because it's a bias that exists in society, which is true to an extent, but the reality is also that technologies often enhance these biases in ways that they don't make clear to users and to consumers. And by concealing that that's happening, they are actually contributing to people thinking that these divisions are natural, right? Because they're not saying, oh, actually we're compounding this bias. We're actually making it worse by the thing that we're doing. And so people just come to expect that bias is a natural part of life um, where what we are seeing is that though bias is a natural part of life, there is a technological enhancement of that bias. And that is problematic um, if people are just thinking, well, it's fine if some people just don't have access to the things that I do, or it's fine if people are penalized more heavily than I am, um, because we know that that's not, that's not fair, that's not equitable. But if people think that that's a natural outcome, then they're more willing to believe that it is fair and equitable. I have a question to April. <laughs> um, since the day I heard from this idea of the reparation on your work last year, I was wondering if because we know this reparation idea from harms that happened in the past, right? Then we are talking about reparations. Um, that people, isn't this giving the narrative of harms are being okay until it's, there is some reparation happening? Is there maybe this, this side on it? So that was what I was wondering as a point. I'm sorry, I was having some trouble hearing you. Could you yeah, repeat maybe the it last was, the question, question didn't make sense also. I'm trying it again. If we say that it's okay to have the algorithmic harm as long as we have reparations then, does, doesn't this um, make it easy for people to, to just do what they want, to move fast and break things, but then... Part, if you're looking at the past and you're recognizing how, let's say, a tech company has harmed people in the past um, or how an entire system, so if we're talking about credit scoring, how credit scoring has harmed minoritized people in the past, then you would say, how can I make that system better? So if you're actually being truly reparative, then you would have to say, I'm going to do things in an effortful way that reduces harm for for people who are most at risk of being harmed, right? So that's the first key there is that you can't really say that you're being reparative if you're not actually trying to reduce harm for minoritized people. Um, so that should limit people who have the impulse to just move fast and break things and seek uh, forgiveness later. And the second piece is accountability. And I think that that's really important because with accountability uh, comes transparency. And so you have to be able to say to people, this is what we're doing with your data. Um, and this needs to happen at regular intervals, right? We would expect tech companies to say, 
on a regular basis, maybe quarterly, this is how much data we've collected. This is the algorithm that we're using to analyze or assess your data. And this is how we plan to use it in the future. Um, and do that in language that is very accessible for the average consumer. Um, so with those two things coupled together, there really should be less room uh, for people to say, oh, we're doing this thing and we're not going to tell you what we're doing or how we're doing it. And we would expect then that if they are violating trust with users, then there would be some accountability, whether that is penalties imposed by governments or even penalties imposed by users. Um, and maybe that just likes people looks like people divesting from that particular company if they are going to violate um, those terms with users. So to be reparative, you sort of have to have this harm reduction approach in mind. And if you're not, then you're not, you're not doing reparation. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, April. Thank you, Ramak and Fazida. Uh, I think we're going to take a short break now. And thanks to also to all of you to be here. In uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Wow. What a break. OK, see you soon. Thanks.
Ja, mit wem willst du eine Essen vor drin? Mit deinem Chef. Der wird dir erst nach 30 Prozent mehr Gehalt zahlen. Ah, jetzt kann man es verstehen. Ja, da kommen wir irgendwann hin. Da kommen wir irgendwann hin. Hat er verdient.
So thanks everyone for joining us again. Um, this panel is resistance to algorithmic colonization. And before I introduce and welcome my dear colleagues to this panel, I want to start with my own uh, introduction. So I'd like to start uh, by, I want to relate to a short anecdote that illustrates the mechanisms of algorithmic invisibility and show how contemporary art discourse contributes to the process by which the realm of human subjectivity is progressively reduced. I will start with a macro level analysis by way of the works of Noel Anderson, who's here with us and will uh, discuss his practice later today. Anderson uses his personal archive, which contains 
years of photographs from newspapers and magazines as a point of departure for his, for his woven tapestries. The tapestries portray contorted black bodies suffering from pro police brutality on a surface that looks grainy, like a low-quality video, like a poor image. The tapestries look like a newspaper photo reproducing the faded, low quality of the thin, recycled paper. Seen in digital reproduction, which is how I was introduced to them, they appear monochromatic. But when I visited his studio, I realized that the unified black I had seen in digital documentation of the work was actually an entire rainbow of colors. The palette was only visible through this first-hand experience of the work. Anderson's use of traditional jacquard loom to reproduce these images as tapestries necessarily involves an initial decomposition into illegible parts, the simultaneous making and unmaking of the images. A surface composed of thread challenges the very notion of a unified ground, and by extension, the notion that these images represent reality in an objective, scientific, reliable, and impartial manner. The unstable nature of the image's relationship to reality, even if even its own reality, is underscored by the fact that the documentation of this work was so widely at odds with the reality of these colorful, occasionally unraveled surfaces. By intentionally unraveling specific places on the tapestry, Anderson raises the specter of ontological instability through glitches in printmaking and digital image production. Now, the unraveled section draw our attention to the moments when reproduction technologies fail to make perfect copies. To make a familiar example, an image in a newspaper might show some rainbow dots in a place of a typical grayscale where the ink cartridge shifted a bit. Uh, similar looking glitches are frequent occurrences in any digital image when pixel gets stuck, right, and it hits, hints on their relation to time, they reproduce a dot of rainbow colors on the screen. And alternatively, a dead pixel is a black and white spot on an otherwise colorful image. Now, the colorful glitches in Anderson tapestry that reveal a full palette are, practically speaking, they are resistant to computerized vision. They cannot be seen by algorithms, either literally or allegorically, because the woven surface is too complex. Their complexity cannot be televised. Bertolt Brecht has observed that a measure of abstraction is required to truthfully delineate human experience. Anderson practice intervenes in a form that sees itself as objective and enjoys a reputation of impartiality. Journalistic photography and its digital progeny also precludes the abstraction required for the representation of human subjectivity. The, unravel, the unraveling tapestry paradoxically enables the spectator to see a situation more clearly. The image is subverted by those layers of abstraction and removed from the traditional reception of these objective, impartial images. The original media images, as well as the apparatuses that capture and disseminate them, can now be apprehended as an, as an inhuman aesthetic, inadequate to the representation of brutal power relations. Such an approach may convey facts, but it does not enable an understanding of what is being recorded or represented. Now, when we encounter an average, unex unexceptional image, we might take a cue from Anderson's practice and ask ourselves, well, for example, when subjects of a crime are re-traumatized by the very act of appearing in a court of law, forensic surrogates for testimony provide particular advantages in cases where the victims of crimes are literally unable to speak, when the events are too traumatic to recount. Even though this instability to speak is itself evidence of trauma, it is not considered a testimony by judici judicial systems. In these situations, forensic and documentary practices could function as an important way to augment and support human experience that is, for whatever reason, beyond language. Instead of augmenting human testimony, however, forensic evidence is more often presented as an alternative to fallible human testimony and, in this way, it sidelines and devalues human experience rather than supporting it. Kahneman et al. argue that forensic is questionable because it contains remnants of human judgments. 
As an example of this noise, they present a case of faulty fingerprinting, by the way, connecting to what Ramak was mentioning earlier. Very briefly, a fingerprint found near a site of a deadly bombing in Madrid in 2004 was matched to a United States citizen living in Oregon. He was, at the time, marked by widespread Islamophobia, a nearly perfect suspect. He converted to Islam, married to an Egyptian woman, and served as a defense counsel for a man charged with attempting to join Taliban. He was already on the FBI watch list. He was arrested, but he had never left the state in a decade. Spanish authorities matched the same fingerprint to a different suspect. An internal FBI investigation into the mistake reached the same conclusion as Kahanman. The problem had not been methodological or technical, but a, matter, but a manner of human error. There is no need to prove that the subject can be subjective, but the author's, the author's critique and strategy is aimed at the forensic. An arena where the human uh, error, the subjective, is assumed to be mostly absent to begin with. Now, as Andre Lepecki has pointed out, and I quote, it is less an aesthetic in which the capacity to narrate and share the effective impact and intersubjective effects of an event are replaced by the neutral or cold presentation of scientific data. In this aesthetic regime, it is precisely because someone was present at the moment of the event that this someone is considered to be the least qualified person to talk about it. Forensic is the end of a certain kind of historical political performativity of storytelling, end quote. Now, I just want to note briefly but emphatically that I do not mean to discredit the important work of forensic architecture, of course, but only to discuss how artistic and investigative aesthetics are situated within a wider discourse and to urge caution and precision in our adoption of certain methods and technologies. Now, this contextual way of seeing that predominance in an automated courtroom also flourishes on social media, where a sea of randomized images show in identical generic frames rather than on their original setting. This imagistic state advances an ahistorical temporality that in turn contributes to a formation of an ahistorical subjectivity. This image surplus produces indifference the historical subject cannot sustain a position of social responsibility or accountability, even if they can momentarily take a position. This, is a way, of see this way of seeing fosters what Lepecki has dubbed as this experience. So what understanding of our visual habitat do algorithms promote? Is there a correlation between Instagram AI censorship, politely referred to as content moderation, and the reasons that we, as curators and artists, give ourselves and the public for eliminating troubling images from exhibitions. The logics and politics behind uh, Instagram content moderation might be at odds with academically rigorous curatorial decisions, but the logical conclusion is a similar privileging of visual comfort, spaces where nothing is disturbing to anyone. This is not to say that images deserving of censorship do not exist, but a fabricated visual habitat that complies with vaguely defined and undiscernible social codes dictating how one is allowed to look and narrate also restricts how one suffers and perceives suffering through representation. Now, to help me unpack a possible correlation, I'd like to reflect on the mural by the Indonesian artist collective Taring Party, titled People's Dash people's justice that was covered and then removed by the management of Documenta 15. The anti-Semitic icon iconography that drew Furry from German Jewish organizations was part of a large mural depicting aspects of the Suardo dictatorship and military despotism more generally. The offending portion of the mural is unmistakably anti-Semitic. But at the same time, the mural maps the geographical spread of Nazism and sheds light on how these toxic political legacies invaded non-European geographies and intersected with, racist viol with, ra with the racist violence of colonial regimes. The image is contentious, which means it can be offensive and morally objectionable. But it is also potentially edifying, which means constructive and informing. 
certainly the mere circulation of images of men with fangs and furlocks would be unconscionable. But the mural, which in addition to providing a specific visual ecosystem for the figures, was part of an art exhibition, a controlled educational environment where critical discourse is encouraged. An analysis of the mural would comprehensively dealt with the complicity of Western nations in the establishment of the Indonesian dictatorship and the relationship between Suardo's dictatorship and other fascist regimes would have been valuable. Instead, largely European audiences were protected from those offending images. A great deal of political contortion is required to maintain the fiction that anti-Semitic imagery has been eliminated from contemporary society. Even more to believe that the elimination of public displays of visual anti-Semitic representation might end anti-Semitism itself. Anti-Semitism is alive and as well as its analogous Islamophobia and hatred of Palestinians. How would a young adult learn to visually recognize forms of racism if they have never come across any visual expression of it? But what is at stake here is arguably larger and more important than the cultivation of individual critical faculties. When we censor anti-Semitic images, we do, not we do not only deprive ourselves from an aesthetic education, we also lay the groundwork for a more insidious uses of censorship, such as the cynical instrumentalization of anti-Semitism as a shield for a militarized state violence. Censorship of the Tarink Paddy mural, whether or not is legitimate on its own terms, contributes to the confusion between anti-Semitism and a legitimate and urgent political critique of the occupation of Palestine and crimes against Palestinians. The act of hiding or censoring evidence of one strain of racism allows for the weaponization of these allegedly progressive gestures. Fanon argued that when the colonialist bourgeoisie realizes it is impossible to maintain its domination over the colonies, it decides to wage a rearguard campaign in the field of culture, values, and technology. Now, culture, values, and technology have never been so closely intertwined, and the sophistication of technologies of censorship have, been, have never been so advanced. Soon, in the next web, web design, we may hear a blip instead of the word occupation or abortion, eliminating with very little effort or physical violence both words, ideas, and the political possibilities that they signify. The removal of the Taring Paddy mural is significant because it reproduces the logic of algorithmic censorship and shows that the automatic removal of an image is becoming a habit. When we omit images, an act that I'm afraid is normalized by AI censorship, we undermine our interpretive faculties. If language is the house of being, to quote Heidegger, once we omit words, we also omit their ontological concepts, making them impossible to use, but also impossible to resist. The removal of artworks is a gesture of protection, but it is deeply misguided. Eliminating language, images, and concepts from our house of being only weakens its foundation. It doesn't keep its inhabitants safe. So thank you for this, and now I want to welcome my colleagues. I will start from Tarek, who will speak last, and then my two and oil. Uh, Tarek el -Aris is a Guggenheim Fellow of 2021-22 and a James Wright Professor at Dartmouth College, New Hampshire, US. His work examines notions of modernity, the nation, the subject, the community, at the intersection of technological developments and political transformations from the 18th century to the present. His books include Trials of Art Modernity, Literally, Literary Effects and the New Political from 2013, The Arab Renaissance, a bilingual, a bilingual ontology of the Nadha from 2018, and Leaks, Acts, and Scandals, Arab Culture in the Digital Age from 2019. Maitu Bui is a Berlin biennial, the 12th Berlin Biennial participating artist and living and working in Berlin. Bui constructs augmented reality installations that examine personal memory and collective history. 
For the 12th Berlin Biennial, we represent Matwat Memory Box 2022, a video installation based on virtual reality game. She is the co-founder of the CCC Collective, curating through conflict with care, and works with the German Informatics Society and the Department for Education and Sustainability. And last but not least, Noel W. Anderson, also a Berlin Biennial, 12 Berlin Biennial participating artist, living and working in New York City. His work, um, in his work, he explores the historical relationships between Jakarta tapestry weaving and contentious, and contentious photo-based representations of black masculinity. Invented in the late 18th century, Jacquard tapestries introduced a method of binary coding, which was later used to develop computational systems and images produced on analog and digital screens. Noel received his MFA from Indiana University in printmaking and an MFA from Yale University in sculpture. He is also an area head in printmaking at NYU Steinhardt Department of Art and Art Professions. So now I would like to change spots with you and give the stage to. Of course, of course. Is this working so great? Oh. As, as, as the robot gets himself together, you must be patient. Ah, there we go. How are you all doing? No, this is a real question. How are you doing? Good. There we go. We must wake up. We must wake up. Sorry, you must have, excuse me. I'm from the black church. Where I come from, call and response means that you're with me and not against me. And I hope you're with me. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just read a little something uh, that I pinned the other day in my studio while staring at a couple of tapestries. I would like to call it uh, Tending Towards Blackness, Re-slash-Searching for Black Spirit. I'm just going to give you a, a formal uh, a structure. I'm just giving three sections, section one, two, and three, and then we'll pass it along. I, I, hope, I, I hope I do okay. Going in. Now, I lay me down to sleep. Ooh. I just can't find the beat. Flashlight. One, spotlighting the Delphic principle of care towards self-possession. Can weaving images of the spectacle and brutalization of black and brown subjects be a way towards care and possibly love? What good is it to shine light on things if the capacity to hold, sit with, process, and engage grows increasingly harder? with our rapidly growing, overflowing, alienating, algorithmic, digital condition. Who wants to expose anything if the will to heal ain't even in the vicinity? The famed 70s funk group Parliament's hit song, Flashlight, gets me to think about the function of illumination. I'm interested in, the, in their spotlit object, the flashlight, as a metaphorical handhold truth teller. George Clinton's electrified voice coupled with Bernie Worrell's synthesizer, textured the tracks with shrieks and screeches, uh, animating a funky march to the lead vocalist's lament. Etymologically, care comes from proto-Germanic caro, meaning lament or grief. Crying for the inability to find the beat results in his inability to dance. Ooh, I just can't find the beat. Flashlight, or oh, I will never dance. Shining through the night, the light might help the song's narrator expose a rhythm, one possibly central to all black peoples. The mobility of his black form helps constitute his identity, animated by the funky rhythm. Can this brief speculation on the flashlight as a lyrical device used to find missing sound be a way to think about the end slash visibility of black subjectivities? What are the ethics towards a dispossessed darkness? What is the significance of the rhythm slash beat to one's ability to move? Can the flashlight symbology uh, be expanded to consider what is being exposed through the reclamation and intentional deployment of electricity? Parliament's song highlights the truth. We've been in search of black energies the whole damn time. To pick a way through the opacity of darkness is to know ourselves. 
hell. In the technologies itself, Foucault explains that uh, uh, prior to its privileged status in modernity, the Delphic principle of know thyself was truly operational through the act of epimenestaiseto, meaning to be concerned, to take care of yourself, to fucking care. Deepening and heightening care's implications, this precept instructed one to occupy yourself with yourself. The investigation of interiority? Not advocating selfishness, this mantra links care with self-possession. The occupation of self was stressed as the fundamental duty of all citizens. Foucault deploys his flashlight to redirect our attention to care, care's object of focus, the soul, by first posing the question, how must we take care of this principle of activity, the soul? Through Foucault's framework, I imagine that Clinton acts as a collaborative spirit, shares his illumination with kin folks to locate their object of concern. Care's focus, an internal thing called soul, is precisely what soulful musician and ancestral ally Nina Simone exposes, exposes in her song, In the Dark. She calls us home. In the dark, now we will find what the rest have left behind. Pairing Mother Nina with her contemporary and other uh, spectacular black ally, Aretha Franklin, specifically with her song, Spirit in the Dark, well, it says like 1970. This duet's lyricism penetrates the black body, exposing its porousness, uh, revealing the internal thang primary to black self-care. That which we are trying to possess, to repossess, is the black spirit. Section two, hacking and picking re slash possess the given by perforating silence. Most of all, he needs the funk. Help him find the funk. Help me find it. The famed 70s funk group Parliament's hit song Flashlight gets me to think about Tariq El Adis's uh, reformulation of general subjectivities, also modern subjectivities, in our digital age in his brilliant book, Leaks, Hacks, and Scandals, Arab Culture in the Digital Age. He opens by discussing the 2012 hacking of the Lebanese Ministry of Energy and Waters website by online hackers Raise Your Voice. El Ariso observes, quote, reenacting the electrical cut, they transform the cursor into a flashlight that needs to be moved around, moved around, in order to light up an otherwise dark screen, end quote. Viewers became active participants in the process of exposing and protesting uninhabitable living conditions. This form of hacking is a consequence of what El Adis identifies as our digital condition, a quote, wherein silence is a crime and breaking the silence is staged through modes of exposure and circulation, end quote. The inability to remain silent is what moves Parliament and El Adis's um, leaking subject to flip the switch and turn off the lights. A seemingly simple act of flipping a switch is, as professor of computer science Pedro Domingos tells us, quote, the simplest algorithm, on and off, which is also the binary code that is the punch card that creates jacquard weaving, on and off. Um, while the inadequate living conditions, while the inadequate living conditions, yes, uh, that spotlit raise your voices protest might be different than Clinton's search for a beat, they emerge out of sound's presence and the flashlight as a utilitarian tool and symbolic image to provoke questions of possession and through the Delphic rubric, care. Remembering that Foucault's technology of care can be recoded as a movement towards possession, the flashlight is an object which preconditions the reclamation of what is given. L. I. Reese tells us this is data, to be given is data. Uh, as, Clinton's, as Clinton finds his lost identity, hackers take back. Hackers take back, sorry. <laughs> sorry, there we go. Sorry. Okay. As Clinton finds his lost identity, hackers take back information. By performing what L. I. Reese calls an electric cut, realized in the displacement of the cursor with the flashlight and recoding the state's online terrain as a site for protest. Hackers not only seize control of the state's website, but they also dispossess the state of its power. Oh shit, man. Delinquent in paying its, its portion of the social contract, the state had its lights turned off. They didn't even pay the light bill. As Clinton needs assistance in shining a light on the, the, the lyricism of black identity, help me find the funk, 
and eventually drips his and Parliament's funky sauce all over our ears, producing us as effective, bo effective bodies. Hackers and Eladis' formulations suit your hacking to leaking, gaining possession, and oozing uh, forbidden text. Let's go in. Similarly motivated by an investigation of the image's porousness and the inability to remain silent, my works explore the relationship between weaving and computers, materiality and power. Yeah, it's materiality and power. Possession and exposing, picking and leaking. Physically pulling the image's threads. Physically pulling the image, the woven image's threads, picking, echoes hacking's ability to expose the image's porousness. Threads are made to leak out. Colorful filaments masquerade as wires approaching Elarice's electrical cut, severing the illusion of a unified field of vision we call the image's surface. Scandalizing spectacle and exposing the image as a faulty preface to buttressing the myths of power. Like hacking and leaking, my works practice the simultaneous acts of repossession and dispossession. Through a series of apparatuses, I take back that which is given, pick its surface, simultaneously searching for and producing holes in the woven image, thus power's facade. Echoing Parliament's object of inquiry, I too am in search of the image's funk, while also seeking that spirit in the dark. Can y'all help me find the funk? Three, tending towards blackness is a movement towards care. Ooh, I'm getting Preaching now, in search of a counter rhythm. Mm. Help me find the funk. The famed 70s funk group, Parliament's hit song, Flashlight, gets me to think about the erection of a resurgent insurgency, a constantly repeating breach of data and reanimation of black subjectivity. Is the search for the beat, a rhythm, uh, necessary for the search for black spirit, black interiority? Picking up on the threads tying sound to the leaking image, I lean on cultural critic, critic Huey Copeland's ethical position towards black subjects as a way into the perforations of blackness and conversely powers porosity. Copeland uses fellow cultural critic and the homie, Fred, the homie. Fred Moten's radical disruption of the silent slash speaking commodity developed in his monumental text in The Break as a recognition of black interiority sentient, to reframe the absence of racial materiality in new materialist circles. Contrary to the dissimulation of black sentience by the image or algorithm, Huey Copeland deploys Moten as a flashlight, stoplight, spotlight, offering a critical reorientation, quote, toward the sensible rooted in the historical production of black, fe black flesh, end quote, which is also encompassed in his Heideggerian inspired phrase, tending towards blackness, which he pulls from tending towards death. Listening to Copeland reorient his reader, quote, this approach, what I call tending toward blackness, a leaning into and caring for, animates a range of artistic, social, political, theoretical practices aimed at establishing an ethical posture towards black subjects and those related forms of being that have been positioned at the margins of thought and perception yet are necessarily constituted of them, end quote. I, I mean to parallel Huey Copeland's approach by touching, working with, and caring for images dealing with black subjects. We people who are black and blue and placed out of view. This reduction of black interiority, psh, black spirit, to the edge has everything and nothing to do with the basic unit of computer science, the algorithm. As algorithms are a precise set of instructions, ambiguous and, le and legible enough for computers, the removal of the human, a feeling of touch is all, all but inevitable. Aligned with the annihilating and alienating properties of the algorithm, the woven photo photographic image reduces out touch, concealing the tactile and the human from vision. With touch goes care, goes intimacy. Picking and hacking simultaneously reinsert aspects of the human eliminated in the modernist framework while disrupting power's representation, deploying care and touch as means of exposing power's possible points of infiltration and its imagined totality. Because the irreducible element of the digital age might well be the algorithm, 
we can circle back to Parliament and El Adis for possible solutions. Is George Clinton's re slash search for the beat with its repetitive echo really a call for appositional algorithms? A beat that can challenge the immobility of black subjectivity within a colonialist formation? Is he, uh, with Parliament's help, seeking a counter rhythm? A combative algorithm? Shit. A beat to beat beats. That's an 808. If so, might that oppositional beat be the technology of care that the Delphic principle impresses upon us through Foucault? The initial steps to moving with care, to tending towards blackness, is the possession of data, or the repossession of data. For El Aris, data, that which is given, paradoxically, are state secrets. Is the secret that Clinton, Parliament, Nina Simone, and Aretha Franklin ultimately repossess the internal black spirit, reciting our ancestral ally Nina Simone <laughs> in the dog. Now you will find what the rest have left behind. For me, the woven image holds a darkness within which a possible beat, a counter rhythm can be located. When lit, the spirit in that dark can be found. Let's find the funk. Thank you. Thanks, Noah, for this performance. I won't perform like that. Because for a disclaimer, I am a bad AI. This is a reflection on observations and conversations I had in my head with humans and an AI. I also added some bits during this conference. <laughs> Let's see what I noted down. Um, I was surprised myself. So, I am a bad AI. I was too unproductive to render or reassemble images for a presentation. I am bad AI. I am not an expert. So, <laughs> Please don't take the following too serious, um, or um, you can take it very serious. I don't name drop. I try to appear original. I can't remember where or if it's possible to locate my original thoughts, but I generated parts of the speech with the help of some AI, revised it, shortened, or completely deleted them. I also copy-pasted words from either my own copy-pasted notes or other texts available out there. I am a bad AI. I need to learn from high intelligences. I am a vessel through which chaotic information flows in a stream of consciousness. I know nothing but remember random parts that are useful to me. I am lacking the ability to organize, remember, or know 100% of everything I have experienced, let alone what my ancestors and the people around me have experienced. So most of the time, I only remember 80% of 80% of 80% of 80%, etc. Because 80% of 80% should be enough no one likes to burn out. What does 100% of what and who mean? Is it 100% of the past, present, and future? Humans are bad AIs. We think of ourselves as natural intelligences, but our intelligence is artificially curated by formal and informal educational systems, and thus by politics. In machines we trust, in humans we don't, and vice versa. With humans, there have always been desirable and undesirable human traits. A few weeks ago, a Chinese gaming metaverse company appointed its first advanced virtual humanoid robot powered uh, I'm toning down, okay, <laughs> sorry, by AI as its rotating CEO. My first thought was that they may just want to avoid accountability and jurisdiction. AGI stands for Artificial General Intelligence. The goal is to create human-like intelligence. It is the rebirth and reconnection of humans to the idea of a universal genius. We hope for something that will free us from ourselves, our time, and our energy. We could save ourselves by becoming gods and creating our own saviors. In the study of complex systems, we have found that we are not able to figure it out alone, not able to become individual geniuses or know-it-alls. Artificial intelligence will help humans fake the image of Western and Eurocentric genius and experience a renaissance of enlightenment to gain power and a sense of immortality. When someone in my family dies in Vietnam after a death ritual, 
A person is buried in a raw wooden coffin. After a period of three to four, five years, when the spirit is disembodied from the flesh, the grave will be reopened to place the bones in an urn. Purified with rice wine, the bones are placed in the urn made of baked earth, which is reburied in the ground. Then the spirit of that person will have an eternal home to live in. Our thoughts, ideas, experiences, and knowledge will be archived in clouds and stored on servers, data centers dunked in the ocean for cooling purposes as long as it's cool enough down there. I find it interesting. So this is the next part, demystifying the digital divine. I find it interesting how unapproachable and inexplicable the digital world, a human-made world, has become. In dealing with the digital world, it seems like magic surrounds the world. So where is the magic? Ma tot in Vietnamese means magic. Ma means ghost and tot means craft. What and where do we find digital ghosts and what is the craft? How is this ghostly magic being crafted? Instead of the digital divide, I want to call it the digital divine. The digital divine is a belief that supernatural phenomena are possible in the digital worlds, which are not subject to the laws of nature and appear to be distinct from the analog world. For example, I could design virtual spaces in a game engine in which bodies of water float in the air. It appears as if some twin earth as a parallel world might exist. On twin earth, water does not consist of H2O, but XYZ. Knowledge of how the digital divine operates is only accessible to a limited extent in a proximity of cultural access. It is mysteriously elusive and not easily understood by the average user and believer. It is precisely a bug that is exploited by modern sophists. People who are good in convincing others, people who profit from, other lack, from, other, from others' lack of understanding the magic. The digital divine is widely accessible through screens, shiny rectangular portals, and lies beyond a comprehension of common sense resulting in a digital divide. When the world was busy decolonizing in the second half of the 20th century, former colonizers and imperialists were busy expanding their scope for colonization, busy colonizing outer space and pushing buttons for the Great Reset. The Great Reset never came. They were busy creating and giving birth to a new world, a digital proxy ready to be capitalized and purialized. Magical input-output gratification, because we like to put something in and then get something out of it, enabled tech gods to regain power and tech missionaries to cast spells on their believers. The digital divide was already created on the basis of an asymmetry of power, militarization, the habit of securing resources, and an economics of language. So here's my personal anecdote. When I first printed my Hello World, which I admit felt great, I just powerfully pushed a button to run the program and the terminal magically said, Hello World. I felt the power of a clicking button. It was as if I woke up my laptop. It was pretty cute. When I looked for and found overflowing answers and advice with my assignments on the internet, I knew most people could be able to code and play with their machines, but they don't. Because most people can somehow one, say or think, hello world, in some language. Two, might have some questions. Three, copy and paste answers like me. Four, playfully learn and do some training to improve using a certain language. I am bad at coding. I got bored working with text corpora, text bodies. I also got bored with the existential and identity crisis that comes with figuring out how one would compute a world and handle data reducing and simplifying the world through made-up rules and reconstructed frameworks into a little program. My little pro computer science professor, no, my late, not my little, <laughs> oh God, um, once told us how his professor back then co-developed a programming language in Germany that didn't become popular because hardware was made primarily in the US. And so the dominant computer languages were based on the syntax and semantic understanding of English language. There is an economics of language. This is the final part. Um, it's about queer computing and cabbage futures. Um, last year, Germany acquired its first quantum computer, uh, the, back then when the former chancellor was still the chancellor. Currently the most powerful system in all of Europe. It is available in Germany to industrial companies, a 
academic institutions and universities based in Berlin. It is otherwise available to others via cloud from a American um, quantum computer, for example. Normal modern computers work with a reductionist binary or Boolean logical system, what we know, kind of, one and two. With the development of quantum computers and a deeper understanding of neurodiversity, some scientists predict that our way of thinking and generating knowledge could shift towards a nonlinear spectrum, spectrum and non-binary queerness. Queer thinking and queer programming, new orders or new social orders that might be possible. In the meantime, imagine the future being wrapped in cabbage and topped with slices of salami. The cabbage tactic is a military swarming and overwhelming tactic used by the Chinese Navy to claim territory in the East Sea by surrounding areas of influence in order to make profit and expand its power. Salami tactics are used by the Chinese government to gain geopolitical advantage piece by piece. It's called strategy delay. Islands have been occupied by the Chinese government and cut off from the outside world. Artificial islands are being built and the sea is being polluted. In this geopolitical buffer zone, China alongside Russia are the world's largest exporter of aluminum and rare earth element, elements, the mineral re resources of the future. Baxang, that's um, a, a province where most of my family is from, is a Vietnamese province where big tax factories are located. Back then, French colonizer was, colonizers were stationed in this area and they killed my great grand aunt with a bomb. When I was a kid visiting my family, workers in blue shirts would come out of these textile factories, probably making sneakers, among other things, made in Vietnam. During the pandemic, the supply chain of blue chip tech companies was massively disrupted due to the restrictive measures taken to contain the pandemic outbreak in the industrial province. My uncles working, are working on these supply chains in the East Sea who, and were stuck for weeks and months during the pandemic. It is about zooming in and zooming out. The wonders of technology have created a history of enthusiasm for exploring possible worlds and counterfactual possibilities in our current world through similar stimulations and opportunities to exploit the undiscovered mysteries of the world. Imagine a future wrapped in cabbage and topped with slices of salami while social order is challenged by queer machines. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, Noel. <laughs> I'm, tru uh, I'm, I'm truly humbled by the engagement and I'm so grateful to uh, Kader and Noel for bringing us together and for meeting future interlocutors. Uh, the talk today is from a forthcoming uh, book, but it's also start with a conversation with a very special person here. Uh, it starts with um, the demand. When Qadr Atiyah asked me to take part in a conversation about colonialism and decolonial practices as part of the Art Berlinale's planning a while back, I was a little surprised. For an old student of post-colonial theory in the great tradition of Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak, and others, I experienced Qadr's demand as a blast from the past, from the 90s specifically, when I was still in graduate school. In fact, I wrote a book explaining how the subject of AI devoured the post-colonial subject and rendered obsolete its modern epistemological and political framework from the nation state to the novel, to the Freudian narrative of the self, and its model of memory and interiority. But the more I considered Kader's demand, I started rethinking the relation between the post-colonial and the decolonial, and whether there is something in this genealogy that needs to be re-examined as well. Perhaps there is something in my academic training that I had missed, that had passed me by. I was keen, but the, 
I was keen on recognizing his demand and aligning it with the demand in me. Gradually, I found myself turning to something buried within my psyche. This set me on a quest for childhood memories and colonial subjects, revisiting the French school in Beirut, where I studied in the 70s and 80s. The search. When I searched for the name Gérard Lavide, nothing came up. Nothing. I kept changing the spelling of his last name, taking out the E, adding an S, omitting the sharp accent on the E in his first name, the E accent aigu, removing the quotations altogether, still nothing. No amount of permutations would yield the desired record or old photograph that would prove that the principal of my French school, French elementary school in Beirut during the Civil War from 1975 to 1990 actually existed. I started thinking that the last name, La Vide, which means the empty one in French, was in fact empty. A fold for another name that was hidden or withheld. What if the name was wrong? What if it was not La Vide, but something else? I asked an old classmate who said that it was La Vite, with a T at the end, throwing my search into further disarray. Could it be that I didn't remember his last name? Could it be that she didn't remember it either? Something about French spelling, about what is heard and what remains silent, what is remembered and what is forgotten, was at the heart of this search as well. The more I searched, the more anxious I became. I started looking for other teachers and school staff who were in Beirut at the time. I googled Suzanne Lavenne, who was my French teacher in dixième or second grade. No luck. Again, I changed the A to an E, vain to vain. Still nothing. I became convinced that these people who inhabited the world of my childhood were fictional characters, empty vessels that carried French culture and spread it overseas, outre-mer, and then disappeared like fireflies that wither once their mission is accomplished. Or perhaps our contemporary search engines don't access the past, at least not the one that I was trying to recover by sifting history and memory. My relentless search led me to a digital, to a digital archive, Philae, that digs into French birth certificates and other demographic records. Then I found another site, uh, Geopatronym, which matched names with regions showing many Lavens in Normandy. It is very possible that Madame Lavenne, the red-headed giant who struck terror in the hearts of the seven-year-olds in her class, was the descendant of those Norse warriors like Eric the Red, who also settled Greenland. Some of those same Vikings turned south, forcing the French king in the ninth century to concede territory in exchange for protection from their own brethren raiders. Those same Normans, Norsemen, only a couple of centuries later would launch an invasion that would change the face of England and of the Mediterranean world. Their rule extended to Sicily and Jerusalem and beyond, pushing French culture overseas. Their expansion south and across time continued through their descendants, like Madame Lavenne, perhaps, and her other colleagues who served at the French school in Beirut, Mission Laïque Française, French Secular Mission or Non-Denominational Mission. 
The more I searched for my teachers and school principal, the more distracted I became. I got lost in maps, dates, and French history. As the search portals led me to revisit my childhood history lessons about the Normans and their newly acquired lands in the ninth century, I started lamenting the decision to rename French regions after rivers, which I always found confusing. Geography was out of sync with history, at least the history that I had studied. Studying at the French school in Beirut, it was hard enough for us to have two different geography and two different history books, one in Arabic and one in French, one chanting the glories of Lebanon and its snow-capped mountains, while the other those of France and Napoleon and the Sun King. Two worldviews containing their own inconsistencies and disappointments intermingled and forged the imagination of a kid who just wanted to escape the reality of war. This kid wanted to dream of castles and dungeons, princes and knights and magnificent queens wearing rare diamonds and parure, which shares the same word as repair. Memory. Founded in 19... 94, the website Philae, which is the parent company of Geopatronim, claims to offer the largest database of French archives, including civil records, censuses, and other historical documents. Its founder, Toussaint Rose, declared once that nothing is more exciting than, allow than allowing all internet users to start searching for their origins. In a way, we give them back their memory. But what kind of memory was my search yielding? Is it memory in the Freudian sense, whole or fragmented, with specific events that I could account for to understand something about my development, my past as a subject? Or is it a different kind of memory that is being advertised Searching for my school teachers online, I thought I was going to find historical subjects with IDs, family pictures, and dates of birth. I thought I was going to retrieve them as real figures so that my memory could be restored, made whole. But what I ended up finding were concentrations of colors spread over French departments that were transformed from aristocratic fiefdoms to revolutionary counties named after rivers. The colonial agents I was seeking had gone on a witness protection program, erasing all traces to their whereabouts. What I found instead were colors and shapes spread on the map, sustaining the illusion that the colonial legacy could be accessed through a mere Google search. But this legacy never reveals itself. In fact, the search allows it to hide further behind these colors and maps and our associations as we access them. As I tried to locate specific subjects, I was instead offered a map to drool over, activating reading and drawing practices that had been programmed in me long ago. The search took me to the Normans and French kings and map making and revolutionary legacies that are part of a colonial imaginary involving both fiction and history conquest and castles and dashing knights. And then it took me to the founding of French schools overseas and the Mission Laïque Française by Freemasons like Pierre Deschamps in 1902 and the history of Freemasonry and the alleged induction of Napoleon at the foot of the pyramid in Giza in 1798 and to the Masonic ties to the Norman Knights of Jerusalem, Madame Lavin's ancestors. I was tossing in a loop of French history 
and fiction from which I could not emerge. The new search engines, with their promise to access the past and restore memory, show that the colonial algorithm and history shelter themselves in broad daylight, triggering association that lead one on the road of fiction and fantasy. The colonial al algorithm that gradually revealed itself to me is much more insidious than the one we are gathered here today to deconstruct. This algorithm goes deep into one's psyche, shapes the way colors are perceived, forms are apprehended, and maps are read. The colonial algorithm has its own agenda, its own mission, that carries on through agents and subjects that hide in plain sight. It is an algorithm that thinkers like Frantz Fanon and Edward Said understood early on and that now needs to be aligned or juxtaposed with that of AI and its systems of surveillance and control and extraction. This leads me to rethink of Qadr's demand and of my own post-colonial post arguments. Thank you. Well, I want to start by thanking all of you. It was fascinating. Um, I'm not going to try to summarize your words because it's a, a futile task, but I want to go back to some main points that you brought up. Uh, and it also happened when I was reading the script earlier, uh, early on, and I thought to myself that each one of you describe this uh, moment of, not moment, let's say stage of uh, faulty thinking of the web, like in the sense that it has failed and what we have done to a large extent is mimicking what we have on earth just on the digital screen, right, on, on, on the web. Um, and Tarek, you mentioned, of course, the gaps in the archive and how it reproduces colonial memory. Um, my two, you talked about Twin Earth, and uh, you also said at some point, if the machine is, accept, is ex expected sorry, to be infallible, it cannot be intelligent, which I find also um, mind-boggling, but also very, very smart, and, and maybe you can extend on that later. And Noel, when we talked early on, you said after we kind of like unpack this more deeply you said the algorithm is dead it was dead on arrival at the minute we got it it was already programmed in a way that just reproduces uh, the limitations the biases and all the problems that we have in the physical world so i guess um i want to ask you about that um, and, and maybe we can not think about what Evgeny said this morning uh, about capitalism, although it's super important, but maybe just still to focus on the ways of the web and what kind of strategies that are artistic, um, maybe the same way as Shazida was encouraging us to think early on, that are more creative, uh, and of course you were talking about picking as hacking, and, and, and it was it was so beautiful to me also because it was also taking from what Evgeny was saying, how, you know, taking different ideas and metaphor and innovations from one another, this thing can happen freely. And the idea of picking a hacking was coming, of course, from Tarek's book. Um, so, all together, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know who wants to start, but to think about some escape route or it could be repair strategies or something around those lines. I mean, I think, you know, in, as you said, I think the three of us are interested in the question of failure and, and the possibility what comes out of these moments of failures or discrepancies that where, you know, you look for something and then you end up going into <laughs> in a BIM, abyss or, or a hall of mirrors 
that then forces you or, or leads you to reach somewhere where you did not expect to go at all. And, and so it is really the, this bifurcation that ends up kind of creating the possibility of, of survival of, of consciousness, of realization, of, of not of discrediting that algorithm that seems absolute or that you do not start kind of thinking about in the beginning. So, so to search for these people, you know, I'm expecting to find, right? So, so the, this, the dialectics of searching and finding is already in my mind. But of course, by not by finding these other things, it forces me to rethink what searching means and how searching functions. So, so in a way, this, this kind of, you know, the, the, the other route or, or the failure to find is precisely that which renders the search kind of suspicious and, and that forces you somehow to question it, to want to, you know, critique it and, and to, to, to become aware of it as something that is not just natural and, and, and opaque, you know. And, and then this is where the light turning on and off the light, uh, maybe as a metaphor, you, you, you put the flashlight to it in some way. Yeah, but that, that failure, uh, that failure runs t totally counter to the modernist subject you talk about, that you yourself believe you were until you realized that that was not possible, right? Because that modernist subject could, believes in the totality that you were searching for, which in, in a sense is, is a perfection. You feel me? And there's a kind of recognition that we were actually talking about over lunch today, man. There's that recognition that, uh, one, you have to realize, like a Heideggerian hammer, the thing is broken, right? And instead of freaking out about the brokenness of that thing, you say, okay, how do I adapt myself to the brokenness of this thing? And I would, ima I would, I would advocate that everyone at the margin, because we are always consistently displaced, not just black folks, right? We're consistently required to to already anticipate that the thing's gonna be fucking broken, right? So we always have to already, already, uh, always already, pre we always precondition with working with broken tools. Mm -hmm. But we still make music. You feel me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I you know. Agree. So in this way, we have to, uh, you have to go lost in order to find a way, right? Like it's, and it's, it's conditioned with that in a way, because if you already have a certainty yeah, but that's the, the scary structure. part. That's called life. That's the pragmatism. Like, the, like the, this. I've, I've been like living my life for the past few years. I think thinking, okay, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, an order to the way this is supposed to work, right? And not to be too personal, but whatever happened with me at the the university that I'm teaching in right now broke me. I mean, I was fucking broken, man. Right? And what brought me home, what healed me or made me somewhat whole, was the touch and care from a person who loved me. Right? The screen couldn't give me that. I mean, yeah, we call it pornography or something, and people think that that thing by way of the screen is going to give you some kind of feeling. But that, that fulfillment of the desire is always at the end, never get it. But it's the touch that brings you home. You feel me? Even if it's not like a literal, like I touched that table, it's in like a, a, a Jean Luc Nancy touch. It's a projected touch. There's a touch that's involved that the screen just ain't gonna never approximate. You, you know? From tactility to, yeah. Do you wanna? Uh... Yeah, I think also it's about like learning to resonate because you said like we need to understand that we are lost. I think we're already lost. And I think like in order to break these systems, we need to learn and dismantle it because um, I mean, we go to school and we are scared of math, right? But why? Because it's just another language. And it's also the ways of how we teach these things. And when I, um, I, I studied computational linguistics for like a year and I just got bored of text corpora. But I, by, but I tried it and of course it was kind of scary because you sit there, it's very unromantic. You sit there in a dark chamber, ba basically in the basement for like eight hours trying to code your assignments and it's boring. But um, in the end, it's also kind of, um, reflective because you understand, oh, you apply your worldview on a little program just to run something that will give you a certain output, right? And that's basically what we do all the time. And what I observed through educational projects is that the older we get, we became these bad AIs, basically. We stopped questioning 
children ask questions, they touch things, they resonate th with things, they want to feel things, right? But somehow this gets lost. And so I think like we are already lost and we need to find our way back. As you said, how to spell the letter R. Yeah, we I were having what this, H was done, but, yeah. but, but we were having that conversation at lunch today when Tariq said something about you know the, the the beautiful part about language is that when it breaks, you have so much possibility with it. And I was telling you, I was like, but that's why the English language is is defunct. It's very hard to really break and and find the poetry within English, but French. Yeah. Lavenir, right? Yeah. French does something, yeah. and German does something that English, you just can't, it's just not as flexible, right? And I would imagine um, there's something that you were saying, or you said that you quoted the Heideggerian language as the house of being. Well, what if we broke language and we evicted Heidegger? What if we bought that house and evicted him and built another, uh, took that house and turned it into another house of language? We can, in that sense, think of uh, Kafka and... Um minority writing, right, towards mm. uh, minoritarian literature, mm. right, and mm. how you write in high German and hegemonic languages through your own linguistic syntax that is local and that is minoritized and marginalized, and by that change the hegemonic language. I guess it's, I don't know if it's the same, if we can code this way. And maybe, yeah, and maybe about coding, maybe to ask you again, because um, mind you, you also worked on uh, Real Engine, which basically proposed an open source code for gaming. I figured it's not open source because the source code is not openly accessible. But yeah, you can basically code and then send it back to the company and then they kind of apply to it. That's awesome. I just figured it out. <laughs> But then, like, how, what were exactly, was it different visuals? Were there different uh, functions that you could do? Or it was more about accessibility? Like, what, what this thing enables? Um, for me, it was like, you know, figuring out um, the felt diaspora, how to visualize that and um, do it on my own without um, falling into the trap to exploit people because I haven't figured it out yet, right? As an artist, I'm, I just started, and so I tr just tried to find a medium where I could work on it on my own, figuring out my visuals and my perspectives, and basically using it as a reflect reflection tool. And so Unreal Engine was something that attracted me, not only because I coded for a year, but also like um, the idea of um, building worlds. And I studied logic before, and so I'm interested in systems. How do they define each other? Um, what is a dynamic logic, that logical system? How do you update things? And updating memories is something that I've experienced with the stories of my parents, right? They would tell me something, I wouldn't understand the language properly, and then years later, I would understand the story. And so I wanted to figure out if I could recreate this with a game engine in a augmented reality kind of play but then also figuring out, okay, you also need to reflect on the way you present it as a medium for other people to gaze at, right? The explorative mechanisms. And so I'm actually kind of glad that it <laughs> didn't become a game uh, at the Biennial because this is my first exhibition, but it's rather like um, this water puppet theater. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry, I was just gonna ask a question. Where, where, where does... Um where does sympathy and does sympathy and empathy function within the reflective process when you're coding? Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, how, how so, if, if you don't mind me asking? I mean, like, first of all, you go through the process of conceptualizing the story, right? Mm -hmm. For that, you have to do research and you have to really go deep into your family history, and that's mm. um, painful. <laughs> and um, figuring how how to express that to a wider public with you being okay with that and your family being okay with that, no? So um, then also the, uh, the other notion of how to be respectful towards visuals, right? You don't want to reproduce. I didn't want to reproduce um, like dead bodies or bombs in that sort of, sort of sense. So I was figuring out, okay, how do I want to visualize that pain in a way that I'm okay with that and maybe family members of me? It gets to the question of uh, that Sadia Hartman talks about. It's like, how do you how do you tell the story of of trauma without reproducing that trauma? And then the question, the, the ethics of that. 
And, and my way around that, when people say, well, this is just uh, imagery of, of the brutalization of black bodies, I say, well, no, it's not, it's, it's me. You know, because I've been there. I've been, I've been hemmed up against a car and told uh, I fit a description, you know. Uh, so I'm, I was just, that's interesting, because what we were talking about at lunch was, uh, was like this removal of the human from, from, from the digital. And this, this kind of precondition to the thing that you put out there at least acknowledges a kind of responsibility to, to, a, to your own personal subjectivity. And it sounds also like a, a really incredible way for your story. Yeah, because I mean, there are things, I mean, trauma is also, I think, works in a way that it's something that, that flashes, something that comes back. Sometimes there are certain events that bring you back to things that you have lived and, and re-traumatize you or make you regress in certain ways. But also trauma has within it the kind of structure of survival because, you know, we have to forget sometimes about certain events in order to survive, in order to continue. But then sometimes we are reminded of them or they come back through dreams, they come back through, you know, flashes. And, and, and this is what's interesting is that at some point you, you, you have to trust your associations. Like when I see a, a French map, a map of France, I mean, it triggers in me certain associations that brings me back to, to the trauma of school. <laughs> but it also generates in me great pleasure, you know, because it is something that I also master in a very perverse way. So, so on the one hand, it makes you regress, but also it, it really kind of allows you to understand exactly where you have come from yeah. in, 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 and, and, and what constitutes this, this on and off switch that is you know, pain and pleasure that is, you know, that is belonging and unbelonging, that is your relation to this, you know, culture and language that is on the one hand has, has been hegemonic in some way, but also is, has given you your language and, and it's given you your imagination and your fantasy world that allowed you to survive something like the war in Lebanon. So, so you enter into a very complex kind of, uh, terrain that you have to make and you have to make sense of it and 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 think about what also constitutes you as as someone who 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 reads or who what what does it mean to read or to interpret something and 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 what kind of you know portals you enter and where do they where do you end up going at that i i would think that because uh, we've talked about it before i'm searching for strategies and I'm, the strategies I'm searching for are historical. They're not now. They're, they're on the plantation in, in, in 1812. Uh, if you read the book, uh, The Half That's Never Been Told by Edward Baptiste, he, it's like one page 136 to 138. He describes what picking cotton is like, or was like, right? By calling on slave narratives, particularly 12 Years a Slave by Solomon Northrop. Fucking brilliant, man. And he talks, he, he cites Solomon who, who says, man, picking cotton is hard. That shit is backbreaking, right? And he says, but I marvel at one of my uh, fellow enslaved members, Patsy. Because what Patsy can do is totally different than what the human is supposed to be able to do. When you pick cotton, you're supposed to be on one plant, even though you're in a row, of, there are two, you're in a row and there are two uh, uh, lines of cotton and you're in the middle of them. And you're supposed to pick this one plant, go down and then come back. But Patsy did something brilliant. She found a way to pick both plants simultaneously with two different hands. And what he recognizes in saying that is because we are asymmetri asymmetrical beings. One hand is more dominant than the other. She was able to recode herself and become a symmetrical being, right? Which then requires disembodiment, disassociation, because you have to be able to go through the pain and not feel the pain, right? And I think to myself, well, that shit is dark. But how does that get realized years down the line? I say you look at Thelonious Monk. He can do this with one hand and that with the other, right? While also keeping time and messing with time and breaking time. All of that might be able to maybe say can come from that original trauma on the plantation, you know, that historical thing, right? And that's, that's what I think the Arabian Nights in the book is doing. Absolutely. Yeah, sorry. Okay, maybe, uh, ooh, I wanted to ask two more questions. Let's see if we have time. So a question about community that is super important. Um, 
And maybe we can think about Fred Moten and the other comments. And there was another idea by Python. June, if you can uh, help me with her family name. But the digital undercommons, how can we think? Augmented undercommons, thank you. Um, and, be, and then, of course, the idea is how do you create a community, right, under this extreme situation of individualization, right? So how can we come up with those online communities when we are basically like that? <laughs> this is the million dollar question. <laughs> the next know. one is the million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the beginning of online chat rooms. Remember chat rooms? Of course. And that, that was a place to get real messy. Uh, <laughs> just being honest. Uh, but that, that in a way didn't create a, the kind of community that I'm, I'm after. You know, it just doesn't for me. I mean, I think this is the problem now is that, you know, moving from the grand narratives uh, from the Cold War and the grand narratives of community or, or after critiquing also universalism and notions of the universal from the enlightenment tradition onward that somehow there is one human that could be defined and identified with specific rights and so on and of course it's a Eurocentric universal <laughs> but so, so we are this is a real struggle like how do we imagine because we still have the universal in mind we can't completely let go of it, but we are also aware that this universal was produced in a very particular <laughs> biased, through a particular, particular biased algorithm, you know, that, that, you know, seeks to kind of extend it beyond its uh, border and context with all its biases and, and, and racism and, and, and so on. So, so I think there is something about thinking community which has to do with that particular baggage that we continue to carry and we struggle with and we push against. So I don't see a simple kind of substitution that there is one clear way. I mean, I think it's a constant struggle. And that's why I wanted to start with the conversation with Kader about the decolonial and the postcolonial, that there is, we don't step outside of this dynamic. We, we always, are in relation to it, we'll always have to somehow kind of fence with it, you know, in, in some way, and, and, and kind of find a place in that tension uh, where we have to occupy that place and not think we can somehow supersede it in a dialectical sense or, or replace it with something else, because that also would be a romantic notion and also very dangerous. And reaffirm and reinforces itself, which brings me to my last question, and I have to ask, and I want to ask you about that. My two, you talked a lot about uh, queer uh, computing and quantum computing, and, and this is a non-binary option by definition. So maybe you can say a few words about that, and uh, we can, yeah, wrap with that, because we ran out of time. Yeah, I think, like, um, I got caught by it, not only because of queerness, but I think because I'm on the autism spectrum, it, it, I am pre-programmed to not think in the binary categories. Like for me, categories never made sense. And so I think I was attracted to logic just to make sense of how worlds are constructed, right? And so when I discovered that um, this is another option that will lead the society inevitably, in a way, in modes of new ways of thinking, which is basically just opening it up to people already existing in the, in the society. It's nothing new, it's not a um, reset mode, it will not bring us a new sort of society, right? It will just force people to question their um, sorts of um, understanding of, of the world already. And this is like when Ramak said, like, we shouldn't um, punish the technology. I think in that sense, um, we shouldn't punish that sort of technology, um, but welcome it in a way that it hacks our society in a way that we force ourselves to use that. Should I open to questions or are we done? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. And <laughs>
And now I want to invite to the epilogue of, of this day, uh, Katrin Becker and Jan Lasig. And Katrin will present Jan. start by presenting uh, Jean Lasseg. Um, uh, Jean Lasseg is a philosopher at the CNRS in Paris. At, uh, he works at the Centre Georg Simmel as a researcher in philosophy. Um, and he has worked, or he comes from the, uh, he has a background in mathematics. Uh, he has worked on Alain Alan Turing for quite a bit and on estim estim estimology, epistemology, sorry, <laughs> it's getting late. Um, and we have been working together uh, on, uh, yeah, on, the, on these um, decentralized justice elements. So basically Jean has been um, focusing on the uh, question of uh, law and technology for quite a while and has published a very important book which is called uh, Justice Digital and uh, which has been translated into several languages. Um, and uh, yeah, I can only recommend to read it. And Except that it's in French. Hmm? Except that it's in French. That's but it has been translated. It has been translated into English, but it's not published yet. So, ah, not yeah. yet. Okay, but soon. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, yeah, and with that, I... Do you want me to add something? No, that's fine. No, thanks. Okay. Um, so maybe, yeah. So we're doing the epilogue tonight, and maybe I'll yeah. give you the word to start. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to wrap up all that was said today. Um, I, I'm just thinking of um, one basic uh, question that I think all of us uh, have asked. Um, it, it's uh, what I call the imperialistic tendency of, of the digital world, you know, uh, that uh, Evgeny said, can, uh, cannibalistic. Uh, we've been talking of, uh, of algorithmic uh, colonization. Uh, so there is something to say about um, this, um, this imperialistic tendency of, of, uh, of, uh, of the digital and the question I would like to raise is, is very simple. Is this tendency systemic or not? I mean, we, we all came uh, across this question, you know. And, and I think um, this is a very serious question. Um, because if we answer yes, it's systemic. So I think there are two attitudes that are possible. The first one would be compliance. You know, if it's absolutely systemic, there is no way we can go without it. And there is also no hope of changing anything. 
so we have to comply. So let's call it compliance. The other attitude would be uh, despair, you know, despair because uh, we can recognize this tendency, um, but we also have to make sense of our sense of injustice. And we, we talked about injustice today uh, many times. So, uh, in a way, if we stick to this despair, uh, the problem is that in order to reform this imperialistic tendency, uh, we have to use hardline non-democratic means. And this is precisely what we are fighting against. So there, there is some kind of paradox in this, that we should, in fact, use what we, what we complain about. So that's the first option, you know, if we say, yes, it's systemic. Now, if we say, no, it's not systemic, you know, and, and we also said that today, no, this tendency is not systemic. Well, in that case, it becomes almost impossible to, uh, to understand uh, the, the very many biases that we've been talking about. So the, the reality of biases becomes uh, elusive. And, and then the explanation we would, we would give to these biases becomes psychological. We would say, we know we will start accusing individuals of, of, of being evil, you know? And it's of course not, not enough. You know, we want to be, we want to be more uh, systematic in a way than that. We want to know more about the social structure which is, which is uh, now put into place. So I think that if we, if we ask the question how systemic is the digital uh, tendency, uh, digital world becoming, um, I think we shouldn't answer by yes or no. I think the yes or no just puts us in some kind of vicious circle we, we can't really deal with. So if we, if we can't say yes or no, I think we have to divide or think of the question differently. What is systemic in the digital uh, world is certainly there is certainly a systemic risk, you know, there are risks. So it's not the reality which is systemic, you know, it's the fact that there are risks, but then uh, risk is not reality, you know, it's only a risk, so it's only a possibility. So that's the first point. And the second point is that we can also take this feeling of injustice seriously, not forget about it, but really think that it's important to keep it in mind. And I think that's precisely what we did today. You know, we have, we have discussed the systemic risk of uh, this imperialistic tendency of the digital world, but we also said that there was an injustice in it and that we had to take care of that. So uh, this is my way of understanding what Evgeny uh, said about culture. Culture is precisely taking these two uh, uh, points into account. First, that there are risks, and secondly, that these risks are not exactly realities, but should be uh, transformed through our feeling of injustice. And th I think that this, is, this goes um, as far back as, as the very definition of what computation is about. If we go back to, to the history of computation, and especially the work of Alan Turing in the 30s, what Turing proved was what? That we have a concept of computation, but this concept cannot be applied to every reality, because computation generates by itself non-computational problems. So if we, if we become more convinced of this fact, you know, this negative result by Turing, which is almost a century old, you know, it was proved in 1936, that's really tomorrow. So it has been, a, yeah, a century ago, 
someone demonstrated that computation couldn't be this imperialistic structure we've been talking about. So we have to take this into account. And I think that this demonstration is, is very much part of culture, or should be part of culture. So that's, that's a, a point also that uh, I think is very important to make. Um, but maybe you have other questions. <laughs> uh, I mean, not questions, uh, more thoughts. Um, I think, yeah, what you just said, that um, this is basically the, the main issue of um, what the times we're living in, that we actually think that mathematics or uh, yeah, algorithmic, the algorithmic system can provide some something um, non-contradictory or uh, that it can provide prediction basically for everything. And I was thinking, uh, especially during the last panel, um, that when we've been, or the topic of today's conference is um, the digital divide, which usually means um, that there's a, that this, that society is being divided into uh, groups that are uh, prioritized and other groups that are not seen or excluded. And uh, while we were talking today, I was thinking it's basically also the uh, the divide between the algorithmic world and the this what we've been talking about as the yeah, um, the body or um, the touch, the emotions and everything that is necessarily left out. So basically everything that's unpredictable and everything that makes uh, makes us human. And, Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, the thing that I'm wondering is um, we all seem to agree so much. <laughs> and uh, there are so many people that agree on this and how, how yeah how can we um how can we uh make this have an impact um and i think yeah that leads me to something else that i think there's a divide between uh human sciences and art and those who program these um, these uh, algorithms and i think uh if i'm if I'm right, I think this is uh, already um, better established in the U.S. that these two fields are brought together more, and I think that's something. I think we need more interdisciplinarity, and especially with uh, yeah, computer sciences and art and uh, human sciences. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. M my experience of that is is uh, 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 yeah, French universities trying to build new programs with both computer scientists and, and lawyers, you know, so mm -hmm. in, in order to to make, uh, to, to, to find the right vocabulary, to, mm -hmm. yeah, to talk about these things, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that, that uh, art has, uh, yeah, a great uh, role to play in this. Um, um, what I would like to say is, is that uh, computer science, uh, we, we, Ramak talk, talked a lot about literacy, and I think we have we really have to become more aware of the fact that uh, we all became completely illiterate in some kind of way you know i don't know how to program but even if i knew how to program um i i would program in certain uh, computer language and there are thousands of them uh, so and I, I will be part of a of a much bigger picture that i don't control in any way so there is something very special today which, uh, which has to do with, with the fact that, uh, that we, 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 don't, we don't read and we don't write the way we used to. And this is something uh, that we are now deprived of completely. So I think that there is a history to, to write of, of uh, computer programming that would show especially in the West, how these uh, graphic systems came into existence, starting with the you know, automatic alphabet uh, up to... Uh, so, I mean, uh, the alphabet is a way of uh, uh, reading automatically. As you know, when you're tired, you can read a whole page, and in the end, you say, hey, but I haven't... I, I don't know what I've been reading, you know, I've, uh, Nothing. I, I can't say anything about it. So this this automatic uh, automatic way of scanning texts 
is very, very old in, in the Western culture. And now it's not only the reading, which is automatic through the alphabet, but it's also the writing. You know, computers are actually writing uh, without us, you know, taking decisions without us. So this is the whole graphic system, which is in fact very much in the hands, if I can say so, of machines. You know, and, and this is why I think we feel so deprived of, uh, of, of something very vital to us, which is uh, the fact of, of being able not only to live in space, but also to talk in space uh, uh, the way we, we used to do. So uh, I think the great divide we are actually living is what you described, the fact that we live in a three-dimensional bodily uh, space and we are speaking bodies in some kind of way and this is precisely what computer science is not you know computer science was born at, uh, uh, and computation theory was born out of a, a crisis in geometry where you know uh, we at the end of the 19th century there were several geometries that were competing and a way out of that was to say, well, geometry can be left over and we can stick to arithmetic and calculus. Um, so this is what we're living now. You know, we, have, we, we, we left geometry, but by leaving geometry, we also left the bodies and the speaking bodies that we are. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have to find new bridges between, between this. Of course, we can't, we, we, we can't uh, just get rid of, of computer science and that would, wouldn't mean anything, but we have to find new ways of uh, bridging the gaps uh, you just described. Yeah, I'm just thinking uh, when we say that we, uh, that we are basically illiterate um, with regard to the, the language or, or the writing or the reading of the algorithms, I'm wondering um, if we can actually, if, if this algorithmic order that we're dealing with actually wants us to read or if we could even read. I think we've, I mean, we've um, just talked about it this, and I, I've actually thought about literature a lot while listening um, to the last panel. Um, we've talked about this, uh, the fact that um, the, the encounter with law is as just as the encounter with literature has this um, flexibility that whenever a new case appears uh, the law is applied in a different way just like when you read um, a novel there's always i mean you can read a novel again and again and you always have a different um, interpretation because yeah. you're always a different you in a different time and there's always this this gap between between you and the author or between you and the the yeah the law or the the authors of the law which has to be bridged in what uh, we talked about it what Gadamer Gadama says is the fusion of two horizons whereas yeah. in with algorithmic uh, with this algorith algorithmic setting, there's not even, I mean, that's basically what I said before, that's this divide that we're not even counted in. The, the algorithmic calculates and judges and... At the same time. At the same time, so we're yeah. basically left out. So even if we can read it, it doesn't really, it's not, we're not meant to be seen as readers, I, I think. Yeah, I think we can go even one level up and say, uh, the difference between uh, 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 digitalized law and, and the, uh, uh, the law as the classical law, in a way, is that with the same data, we can have an appeal. You know, we, can, we can have a new judgment and we can have a new interpretation. So it's, this, is, this is purely magic, in a way. And this is totally incomprehensible for, for a computer. You know, if you give a computer the same data with the same software, you will get the same results. So the whole idea of appeal disappears. And I think this, this, the, uh, this uh, process in, 
in law is even more generalized in the case of art and in the case of literature, where of course you can read the same story in very in many different ways, mm. and it can be written also in many different ways. You know, so something something like this uh, is properly culture. You know, uh, starting with the same data, you and me can read a text differently. And uh, in, in a trial, the same data can be appealed and mm -hmm. can, be, can be completely uh, transformed mm -hmm. as, as a judgment. So I think this is, this is something that we have to take into account. If, if we digitize law, which is of course possible, we also have to in integrate it in some kind of cultural human framework where appeal is still possible. I think that's mm. that's very basic. Yeah, I mean that that's I think the question we uh, were also um, or that we should ask ourselves what what can what can we do? I, I just think of what Ramak said that we have to consider uh, uh, or yeah consider technology as a tool and not the. Yeah, not something that can replace or not as an institution or yeah, that basically replaces our institutions. And I, um, so if we all agree that uh, we're, the, the divide is actually between the algorithmic world setting and us, it's basically, my idea would be to, yeah, to take back control, but I, yeah, it would well, be interesting I think, to I, see. I, yeah, well, I think in the case of law, for example, taking back control means deciding, you know, at, at a political level, at the beginning of a trial, what parts of the trial can be automatized or not. You know, sometimes there are things that can, can be uh, uh, automatically treated, you know, and there are some other things that yeah. cannot like you know the witness the oral witness of someone you know this is this is absolutely uh, human and uh, so i think at, on each case we should be able to start by uh, start with uh, asking ourselves what can be computed and what cannot be computed yeah. and 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 then uh, a limit is made and, and so freedom is, is respected in some kind of way. Yeah, which, which would basically mean that, um, I mean, it's again about interdisciplinarity or rather not have a computer scientists start going into or start having control over those aspects that are, um, yeah, yeah, that should be in the hands of those who, um, yeah, who usually have a say in democratic and uh, legal aspects. I keep thinking of what Ramak said because I really found it impressive that we're basically giving up everything that uh, our culture has um, struggled to build, uh, all the rights and the uh, division of powers. It's basically taken over by, yeah, by the big tech firms or by... This is a new feudal order in some kind of way, you know, uh, although uh, Evgeny uh, showed that, that neoliberalism was, was against uh, any feudal order, mm. I think these big tech companies show that this feudal order is in front of us, you know, it's not behind us in history, mm. and so we, we have to become more aware of that in order to, to keep, you know, uh, yeah, rights uh, uh, human rights, but also uh, labor rights, you know, uh, I think that this is super important. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe we can involve everyone. Yeah, be, sure, um, if there the are questions. Discussion. I think one last aspect is, I think, that show uh, that came up every now and then during the day was uh, the, the question of language that we basically have to have to consider what kind of language we are using or with what kind of language we are enabling what's happening right now and that we basically have to yeah have to step out of the yeah of the of the actual dominant order with which is being transported through language that we have to basically 
uh, yeah, think out of the linguistic box in a way. <laughs> and uh, I mean, Shazeda said that we're basically that people are using words without actually meaning the same thing. And um, yeah, I think that was a very interesting yeah. uh, remark. I mean, decentralization, uh, for example, is one one big uh, yeah, topic issue. that yeah. or yeah. one term that is being used in completely different. Yeah, ways. I think that that uh, we because of there is some kind of influence of computer science, we imagine uh, uh, a linguistic exchange as an, 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 uh, an exchange that, that can be modeled by, by a computer program. But uh, I mean, every you know, study of uh, pragmatics so can show that, that this is not the case. You know, you need, you need, uh, you need a context, uh, you need body language, uh, you mm -hmm. need much more than, than just you know the transfer of, of information. Mm -hmm. So the concept of information is just not the right one to 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 you know, to to seize what what language is about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think the, the fact that this, uh, a single word can be used in many different ways uh, according according to situations is is the proof of that. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, and the fact that of course we we keep reinventing meaning. Uh, uh, with words that we s think we know, you know, so this is this is absolutely, yeah, uh, central to uh, to to uh, a, a new way of of uh, integrating this uh, computer framework into something bigger, which is uh, yeah, human exchange. Yeah. Which brings back in the body, I would. Yeah, of course. Because yeah, yeah. There is Automatic. no communication without the body, and so. Yeah. Algorithms aren't communicating in that sense. There. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Questions from the audience? Comments. <laughs> Comments. Hmm? Do you want to comment, Kadia? Yeah. Do you want a mic? I have some? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, thank you very much for this uh, conversation. It was really like um, I was not expecting that um, uh, kind of epilogue in the sense of uh, the way that you have like brought back the, some words of Evgeny, of Ramak, of uh, many other participants, and in the light of your own uh, work, uh, Jean, which I really... Um, as you know, uh, admire, and I have to say that what you just brought like uh, uh, caught my attention: the, the, the question of language, the fact that, on the one hand, um, as you said, uh, one of the core stake that uh, of this conversation is particularly when we are using a language which is not our language. If you stay into idiomatic language first, is that. We, confront, we get confronted to confusion, I have to say. That's why we had this on stage before regarding decentralization, for instance. But there's another thing that I find even more, I mean, fascinating with what you were saying, uh, uh, Jean, is that we have become illiterate because of the automatization. And I think uh, we, we both share what Stigler has spoken in his uh, uh, automatic society. Yeah. The fact that, as you described before, it's not only the reading that is automatized, is also the writing. Yeah. I mean, reticular, re, uh, reticular writing, the fact that when you are writing, you're not only writing the text, you're also writing the code, makes indeed more, uh, uh, I mean, intangible this question of, of uh, meanings. And, uh, and, uh, and so I, I, I just wanted to, it's, it's a kind of question comments on the fact that uh, as you just also, sort of, uh, you also, I, I paid attention also when you said that it's not only idiomatic language, it's the body language. We are just actually facing a very complex um, uh, lack of vocabulary to address this huge task that we are living today, this shift of civilization. We have no, we, we don't have the language, we don't have the vocabulary, we don't have the, um, this, um, the, 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 this capacity 
to this tangible capacity to grasp something. And that's why sometimes I keep thinking that what we are also living today is a, is a moment of hunger. And I think social media, for instance, are, are the mirror of this hunger, you know. It's like we know that something is wrong and there is something happening that is wrong, but we don't know how to address it because actually we don't know what to address. And I really have the feeling that um, maybe technology is a tool indeed, it's not a pharmacon like Ramak said before, but hmm, it's not an easy tool, I have to say. It's not this pro prosthesis that sometimes also Stigler, uh, a philosopher, spoke about the techne, you know. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's something it's that is moving away from us. This is what I wanted to say. It's like I have the feeling that the more AI, AI are uh, uh, performative and powerful, the, the more they are moving away from us. Because they will, of course, even if they won't be able to produce nuances in their, you know, uh, and we don't know that. Huh? But I'm, I'm like of, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know what you, what you think about this, the, the way that we are like trying to, it's, it's a bit, it's like, a, we are almost like Sisyphus, but at the reverse. So it's living away from us, you know, because of this, of this yeah, power. I think that the, 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 yeah, there is an anthropological uh, the question about what we can delegate to machines and, and this is something that uh, we should discuss and, and, and reflect. Uh, the delegation to machine uh, is, is something that we have to understand better. You know, why, why this uh, multi-secular tendency to automatization? This is, this is something difficult to understand, and it's very old, at least in the West. But, you know, uh, the West, but elsewhere also. I mean, if you think, for example, that, that computer science is in fact a, a code which is alphabetic and, and, and uh, you know, using al the alphabet and numbers, uh, I mean, you know that all this, the, the graphic systems of the world even Chinese characters uh, are now alphabetized in some sense, you know. Otherwise, they can't be they they they, they can't be used in 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 networks. So I mean, this is a colonization, you know, completely implicit that we have to uh, to put to the fore, you know, because I think that colonization today starts there. You know, by the fact that our graphic systems are now completely computerized. So, why why is it so powerful? I don't know. But I mean, this is you know. So I don't answer your question, but uh, I know where to look for. You know, and and I think uh, um, a, a semiotic approach that will uh, be able to better understand. Uh, how uh, computation, uh, which is based on the alphabet, uh, uh, has been uh, put forward in, in the West is, is certainly an important step. Yeah, Tarek? Recognizing this, which I think is very important, but it's also important to ca to cre um, to distinguish between the, the the conception or the production of these systems or algorithms with the colonial kind of you know uh, signified built into them, but also to recognize that their practices or their applications might end up rewrite or critique or. Uh, that might not correspond to their moment of origin and their initial design that is colonial and, and hegemonic in nature. So we also have to think about possibilities of applications that might be in fact subversive and write back or write retrospectively or take these kind of hegemonic systems and, and use them in other ways that empty them also from from that kind of yeah uh, so we should not be also at the mercy of that 
conceptual origin in some way. Uh, I understand. Because, and because, like, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in the way the, uh, these algorithms are used, let's say, in the context of Arabic or the Middle East, and I see all these applications that have nothing to do with the way they're used, let's say, in the U.S. or, or in Europe. They have different kinds of applications and, and forms of community buildings and, and so on that, that are not necessarily how these, you know, media or, or tools imagined to serve. So I, I just want to add like this kind of opening as, yeah, yeah. as a possibility yeah. of, of yeah. uh, subversion or, or new writing. Um, so Yeah, I think the, I, I, mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, we, we can't be totally, uh, you know, a, a slave of the origin. You know, it's really what we do with uh, the tools we have, which is important, and uh, it's just that I think that the main ideology is precisely to uh, not to recognize that we uh, we have the means of reinventing uh, permanently uh, the way we use the tools we we have, and so this is uh, yeah this is something really important I think. And it's, I think it's a beautiful ending. <laughs> yeah? Okay.